yeah, also from my side, uh, welcome. I also can uh, welcome you in on behalf of the DCNE because I think I'm the member here of the AGD who is representing the House. I hope you had a good start and uh, here with lunch. Um, this is the main building of the DCNE. Uh, it's building A of the headquarters of the DCNE. We have 10 sites in Germany. Um, and Bonn is the headquarter of the DCNE. We have two more buildings, uh, building B and C. B is the largest one where all the science is happening. Here in this building, we have administration, population science, and clinical sciences, as well as the uh, Rhineland study. So with Monique Bretler, who also does quite some uh, work into genomics and population studies. Um, myself, standing here, is basically representing what is the DFG-funded uh, NGS competence center. So a couple of years ago, the DFG decided, after many discussions on many levels, to fund certain universities with their capacities to do genome sequencing. And that's why they called them competence centers. Um, the competition was um, won by Kiel, Dresden, Tübingen, and here in West Germany, it's uh, Cologne, Bonn, and Düsseldorf. And we have also partners in Aachen, in Saarbrücken even, um, here at the DCNE, we're partner of the West German Genome Center in Essen. So, and there's other, other institutions like the Max Planck Verzüchtungsforschung in, in Cologne that are partners. So we're having a network in the network um, I am having the honor and pleasure to coordinate this network. So we have a coordination unit. Um, and um, we decided a couple of years ago, this was also a wish of Peter Nunberg. I'm not sure whether Peter is maybe online here. I'll say hello to him. Um, that we want to bring these efforts together to the AGD. And um, like last year, and I think the year before, the first session is giving you some highlights out of these genome centers. Um, not all of them coming from the core facilities system them, themselves, but rather from um, projects that are run within the calls that the DFG has done. So it's a mixture of things that come from the places, but also uh, projects that are funded and then um, serviced and collaborated with these NGS competence centers. And with that, I would like to introduce the first. We um, have uh, this time Dresden, um, who suggested Lukas Schmidt. And he will talk to us about the prediction of designer recombinases for DNA editing with generative deep learning. And I'm very happy that you are here. And this, yes, please, the stage is yours. I think you know the drill. Half an hour means 20 to 25. And then we have some discussion. Florian. Thank you very much. Just have to find my presentation. Uh, there we go. I have it. I have it. Do I need to move it to the different no. screen or? Just on his way. On his way. I think he has some. Need some changes? Hmm? It's, it is full screen. Uh. Oh, okay. Oh, this is a Chrome it's, thing. It's, it's, on it's not PPTX, okay. It's uh, HTML, yeah. Uh, okay, that's a problem. Okay, that was easy. Just press F. Great. All right. Okay. Do you have a pointer? Yeah. Okay. Let's see how that works. Does that work? Yeah, I have to press a little bit longer than press, press on it. No. Maybe just the pointer. Oh, okay. And then yeah. Move slowly. Okay, okay. <laughs> That's the trick. <laughs> it's new high tech stuff. Amazing. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much for having me. I'm very excited to present to you the main project of my PhD work, which is the prediction of designer recombinances for 
DNA editing with generative deep learning. Um, and so why, why do we need uh, DNA editing in general? And I like to just highlight a little bit why research like this is important. Um, there are a lot of diseases, uh, for example, HIV, that you can basically only cure if you change the DNA, if you edit the DNA, because essentially what HIV does is it uh, integrates itself into the genome, and then the only way to get rid of it is to cut it out again. Uh, same with inheritable diseases like hemophilia. You might have um, some defects in a gene, for example, in a blood coagulation factor. The gene usually looks like this, and then uh, in a broken version, you have the first part inverted, and the only way to repair it, to gain these important coagulation factors that make the blood stop running, uh, is to either replace the whole gene or to um, invert this broken piece again. And so for these two applications, actually, what is a really interesting tool to use is uh, recombinases. Uh, you might know, for example, Cree, the Cree looks P system, um, and it's, it's very nice because uh, recombinases are just naturally evolved to basically detect a certain DNA sequence and then, which the DNA sequence in this case is these re red parts here, and then it will excise everything in between those two DNA sequences. Uh, and this is very nice because this, this excision is very clean and precise. Uh, and it would be cool if we could use this for, for other target sites than for these naturally evolved target sites, for example, OXP. However, the problem here is that um, this, this protein is very uh, complex. We do have some understanding how it works, but we really don't understand what we have to change so that it detects a, a new DNA sequence. Um, and yeah, we, we just can't do it rationally. So what we do is essentially we use um, directed molecular evolution. It's a method that's inspired by natural evolution. Essentially, um, it, like we humans evolved to adapt more to in our environment to be more successful, we can also um, force molecules to evolve. Um, basically, we introduce mutations and then we select for the properties that we want. And in this case, for recombinases, we want them to um, recombine, so to edit uh, a new target site. And we have to do this slowly. So we slowly change the target sequence uh, one by one. Uh, and then in the end, we have a recombinist that actually recombines the target site that is um, what, what we are interested in, basically. Uh, this process works very well, but uh, it takes time. It, it takes weeks, it takes months, and it's a full-time job doing this evolution, um, which um, is not ideal. Uh, we would like to be a little bit more smarter. So basically with evolution, we're doing a sort of brute force. We introduce random mutations and then we check if they work. But it would be much cooler if we could, if we could just go for it and, and just change the mutations that are necessary to make it work. Uh, however, we don't know what these mutations are and of course then we were like, yeah, let's use machine learning because that's what you use for everything these days. Um, and uh, exactly, and a type of machine learning that we use is generative deep learning, and you might have heard about this recently. It's gotten quite popular. For example, uh, Google and OpenAI developed methods. Uh, Google involved, evolved, uh, developed Imogen. It's a, a great, uh, it's an image generator ba basically, and the, uh, what you can do here is you can basically give it a sentence that describes a picture, and this method will generate this image. Uh, same with uh, OpenAI's Delhi 2. So we could, for example, make a corgi that lives in a house of sushi or something ridiculous. Uh, and it will make these very photorealistic images, uh, which is amazing, but of course it's Google and they have a lot of you know, data to, to supplement this method. But essentially this is what we want as well for our recombinations. Uh, so the idea is basically, instead of giving it a sentence describing the image, we give it uh, the target sequence. Oh my God, this is so difficult. <laughs> we give it the target sequence, GCATA or something like this, and then what we want to have out of this is the, the protein sequence from the recombinase. Uh, and ideally, we don't want to have one recombinase sequence. We want to have multiple recombinase sequences um, to, because we know there's multiple solutions for this problem. Um, so we also we have more chances to test different sequences uh, that could potentially work. Um, 
yeah, so just maybe some details. Uh, the sequence that we're looking for, this target sequence is 13 base pairs long, and the protein sequence is 343 amino acids long. And this is always fixed, which makes our life a lot easier, actually, for training models. Um, and what I used is something called a variational autoencoder. Uh, it's a cool method. Uh, maybe you heard of it before. Um, this generative model basically works by uh, giving it an input, and then it tries to reconstruct this input. Um, and what happens is basically the input gets compressed to very few values uh, in this bottleneck, which uh, is called the latent space, and then it gets decompressed, uh, and so the decoder tries from these very few values to reconstruct the whole image. And then usually it looks a little bit more blurry uh, than the input uh, but in, you, you still have the same essence, as you see with this image here from a handwritten seven, um, which from the MNIST data set. The model is regularized by the reconstruction loss, uh, but also IKL divergence, which kind of maintains the, the shape of, the, of this latent space to be uh, normally distributed. Uh, and so then if you train it with the whole MNIST data set, which is these handwritten numbers, you would get uh, a latent space that could look like this. Uh, essentially uh, having, you know, kind of a normal distribution shape, but also it's, it's the distribution is based on the shape of the image that you get. Uh, for example, all the zeros will be clustered together by all the, the ones go in the other corner or something like this. And this is the neat thing with the method because since you have this kind of organization in a latent space, you can use this to sample from this latent space. So what you do is you can just take uh, random points in this latent space uh, and generate new ones or new zeros uh, that are also handwritten, but they have not been actually handwritten by someone. They are like artificially generated. And you can even, uh, if you do like some grid sampling like that here, you can kind of do something between a zero and a six. So then uh, if you sample between the area of the zero and the six, you get something in between. Um, so this is the kind of principle that uh, we use for this, but we use a different variant from this uh, called the conditional variation autoencoder. Uh, essentially, you train it with the data, so in our case it's the protein sequence, uh, and you try to reconstruct also the protein sequence. But you also provide it with the target sequence, which is our conditional input, and you provide the, the encoder and the decoder, so the part that reconstructs the, the protein sequence with this target sequence, and then the model will learn uh, basically to reconstruct protein sequences based on the target sequence that is provided, and so then you can just, in, in generation, you can basically just provide it with some normal distribution, distribution sampling noise uh, and uh, the target sequence, and it will generate the protein sequence that you're interested in. Um, and as I mentioned before, it will generate, you know, thousands of different recommended sequences that potentially should work. Uh, but to find this out, uh, I will tell about later. <laughs> so, of course, for me, of course, is the most important part actually um, is the data. So you can, machine learning models are great and all, but you, they always, it hinges on the data. You need the data, otherwise you can forget it. And so this was actually a big part um, that I did, uh, that I'm gonna just scrape a little bit by and that actually the Genome Center was very much involved with. Um, essentially what we do in our lab, we evolve these recombinase libraries. So a library means there are a million of different variants that are specific for one target site. Um, and we already did a lot of evolution, and so I gathered all of these, um, prepared them for sequencing, and then with help of the facility, the, the genome center, we used like bio hi fi sequencing to do full length reads of these uh, genes uh, in, in our plasmids, our bacterial plasmids. Uh, and then I used this very high quality full length data to uh, gather the protein sequence. So I just translated the genes into proteins and our amino acid sequence. Uh, and together with the target sequence, this is of course what I used to train the model. Um, so first, before I did any training, I just had a look at the data and um, it's, it's important to understand what you're working with before you do any machine learning. Uh, and so the kind of important was how, what is the coverage for the target sequences that we have? So, so this, this is the target sequence that we're working with, for example, and uh, then we have uh, positions one to 13, as I said, it's 13 base pair long, and we have three, four different bases, as you might know, DNA has four bases. Um, and so 
I check what are the all possible combinations, uh, and I find that at least for each base and position, I have at least two examples, in, which was good, but of course nowhere near the potential sequence space that you could work with. Uh, I also looked at the mutations that we found in the recombinases, and we see there's a lot of them, so it's, so it's, it's kind of a complex problem. So this is uh, the residue position to un 1 to 343, and this is the amount of frequency we found mutations there, and then the amount of residues we observe at certain positions. Some regions are hypermutated, and some regions are very conserved. Uh, we also checked, you know, how is the distribution of this data uh, of the different sequences, and of course, we found that, you know, if it's involved for the same target site, they usually, they cluster together. They form one cluster, uh, but also sometimes you have multiple clusters in one library because the evolution just found several solutions. Um, but what I want to take from here, basically, is that um, we couldn't do normal train test split validation, what you usually do with machine learning. You just like take 10% or 20% of the data, you save it, and then you train the model with everything else, and then you, you, know, you check with the part that you left out if it worked or not. But if you do this, you will ha still have some of the sequences that are very similar to what you want to predict in the training data set, and this is kind of cheating. It will, it will always be you know, perfect score. That doesn't help us. So what, what we did in the end was uh, leave one out cross-validation, um, and this is, this is kind of neat because essentially what you do is you take your whole training data set and it's separated in these different libraries we have. And then you take out one of the libraries. We call this the target recombinase library. You train the model on everything else uh, and then you try to predict the target site for the target recombinase library. And then you get the predicted recombinase library, PRL in short. Uh, so this, this set of sequences you can then compare to the, the library that you left out, the target recombinase library, and you can see how close is it so how close is the prediction to, the, to a solution that we know works? And um, as, additionally to this, we also compare the target recombinase library to the closest recombinase library, which is essentially just the library with a target sequence that is very similar to the target recombinase library, the most similar, uh, actually. So usually if we would start an evolution, we would take this library uh, and then evolve it uh, until it's this library, but our thinking is so if we use the predicted recombinase library, and it's closer to the target recombinase library, we should, do, we should be faster in evolution. We would save time, basically. So this is why we're comparing this, and the uh, results essentially look like this. Um, and I want to focus on this plot in the middle here first. Um, so on the y-axis, what we have here is the, the distance to the target recombinase library, and the blue box is the closest recombinase library, our comparison, basically and the orange uh, box plot is the predicted recombinant library. And what we want to see here is that the blue is higher than the orange, or that the orange is very low, very similar to the target recombinant library. And indeed, we see this often happening, that the predictions are very close to what we know works, what this evolved library is that we know we have, uh, is while the closest recombinant library are still quite a bit away from that. Um, and so on the right here, I have a, I have a summary plot where I uh, basically have the median difference between those two uh, samples. And as you can see, usually, so everything that's orange, basically the prediction is better than the close recombinant library, while uh, only in three cases, we found that the, the closest recombinant library seems to be better than uh, the target recombinant library. So this was very encouraging. So from computational validation, we could see that uh, the model is performing well. Uh, and uh, this encouraged us to do some experimental testing because all the computational testing in the world, it doesn't matter uh, if, if you cannot prove that it works in the real world. Um, and so what we did for this, we uh, used two different kind of assays, uh, a quantitative assay and a sensitive assay. So the quantitative assay, basically you just compare the amount of edited DNA uh, to non-edited DNA because the edited DNA um, it's 700 base pairs shorter than the edited, non-edited DNA. It's very easy to visualize this in an agarose gel, and then you can just uh, calculate the difference between the two bands and uh, get a rough uh, estimation of how uh, much recombination has happened or editing has happened in this, uh, with this sample. 
then we also have a sensitive assay because sometimes um, with this quantitative assay we cannot really um, see if there's, um, so it's, sometimes it's enough for us if we have like 1% or less uh, editing, we can start an evolution from this, we can work from this, uh, we still save time. Uh, and essentially, uh, this is a PCR protocol. So you see a band, you have recombination. If you don't see a band, you don't have recombination. Um, okay, so first what I did is I tested some, some predictions from this leaf one out cross-validation that I did uh, for some known target sites. So the advantage here is we have, we have the target recombinase library, the library that was evolved for this target site, uh, and we can compare it the activity of the predicted recombinase library to the, to the target recombinase library and the closest recombinase library. So in this example, the library logs A1. This is the target recombinase library target site and uh, the closest recombinase library is changed in two positions here. Uh, and so this is up here is the sensitive assay and here's the quantitative assay. Orange is always the prediction and then comes the target recombinase library and the closest recombinase library. And we see that the prediction is actually doing pretty well uh, very comparable to the other two libraries. Um, while uh, with this sample, we found that it's actually a little bit better, the prediction, and in, in this example, it's even better. Uh, so it's like 34% versus 13% uh, of the evolved library. So this was kind of surprising, not that we expected it to be better. Um, we were already very happy that it works at all because if you generate protein sequences, just you know, just one mutation can mess it up and then the protein doesn't work anymore. So this was very, uh, very nice result. Um, but we don't want, in the end, we don't want to predict for uh, target sites where we already have libraries for. What we want to do is we want to predict for uh, novel target sites. So it's fancy for new target sites that we don't have any libraries for. Um, so what, what we did, because we knew we were kind of limited in the sequence space that we can predict for, is that we, we took some of the target sites that we already have and we changed three positions in a, in a region where we know it, it matters a lot. So if you change something here, it usually leads to a loss of activity of recombinases that you have. And um, so in total, we have 10 new target sites that we ordered prediction from Twist actually, uh, they're outside. And um, yeah, and then, and then we tested those and we also used the closest recombinase libraries to compare this. And this is the results. Uh, and the top you have, so this is all sensitive assay because uh, we didn't get any readout with the quantitative assay. Uh, but we, we found no activity with any of the closest recombinase libraries. Um, so that, that was good. Basically, if we would have to start from this point, we would have to design a subsite and evolve for that subsite, and then we can go to this target site. Uh, versus on the predicted recombinase library, we do have uh, activity in many of these we get a band with the, with the sensitive assay. But as many of you might know, with PCR you can get some false positives. So we had to make sure, and with sequencing verification, we found that in total four of them could be confirmed. Um, so four out, of ten for the, four out of 10 predictions for the novel target sites um, actually were functional on this target site that we predicted for, and this was uh, very nice even you know, if we were maybe hoping for a little bit more activity, um, as we've seen with the target recombinase library, it, it's still already pretty amazing. Uh, and we think that, uh, yeah, in total, that the, the work was a success because we showed that the model, this model type can work for protein sequence generation, uh, specifically with this condition of having a target site. Um, but we know that the task was very complex, so we are very happy with it, but uh, the performance at the moment is of course kind of limited. We have a limited sequence space that we can work with. Um, but we, we think we will be uh, doing more in this direction because it seems very promising and we want to test um, some additional trans uh, technologies like transformers um, to maybe advance the model there, but most importantly, we just need more data. So, uh, Exactly, so we, we just need to get more evolved libraries to extend the sequence space and maybe get some different kind of data, you know, off-target data, how, how specific are they and so on. And I think this will be um, quite, quite interesting um, where this is going, if the first results are already looking like this. Okay, uh, with this I want to thank uh, my group, of course, uh, the 
the genome center that, that uh, did uh, all the sequencing with the PacBio and also some advice. Uh, so this is my group, Buchholz group, oops. And uh, my PI, Frank Buchholz, um, we're all in Dresden, by the way. <laughs> Um, this is my colleague, he helped me a lot with the machine learning, a um, lot of back and forth with him, and this is uh, another, co um, another PI that helped me a lot because he's very experienced with machine learning, more visual machine learning and so on, but uh, yeah, especially writing machine learning papers was very helpful. Yeah, thank you very much. I think I went way faster than I should have, but it's okay, I, I, it, as long as you have followed. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, that gives us quite some time for questions. Um, I'll, I'll, you, know, can, you can think about it. I'll start with one. Sorry, I have to focus. Um, <clears throat> I asked the very high level first, and then we can yeah. go deeper down into technology. So now you have a machine that predicts better proteins than of, of more suitable proteins for a function in nature. If you think that through philosophically, you would say like machine now builds the, the, the carbon nature evolution. It tells us where it's going or have you uh, thought about this? I mean, there's a yeah. practical thing to make recombinases better, but you're opening <clears throat> a completely new thing so far. And there was, you know, we, we say there is nobody that yeah. <clears throat> tells nature what to do with evolution is, uh, you know, there's different philosophies about whether it's all stochastics or whether it's driven by, by pressure on, on, a, on an environment, etc. But now you say like we have a very clear function which a machine can interpret and then suddenly it makes these things better. What's your thought? You must have thought during this process that you're doing this, that there is a higher level than just doing the experiments. I, I think I've never thought of it from the ethical side, kind of, or is, is it wrong or something like this. Um, actually, it, it's more generally a topic that is discussed that we can actually use machine learning to do it better than nature, because nature, it, it is, as you said, it's stochastics, and you can only go from there to there uh, if, if there's a path, you know, like it's unlikely to jump to a region that is, that is hard to achieve because there are a lot of mutations in the way that would be detrimental, but behind these mutations, maybe there's a set of mutations that is very beneficial. And mm -hmm. so I think that a lot of people are using machine learning specifically also to get this combination of mutations that would uh, make the protein better than what nature could produce or what you could produce with direct evolution or something. I think that's very exciting to think it doesn't bother me, to be honest. No, it's not also yeah. bothering, but you could think forward, you know, you could be used it could mean that, you know, it's also about speed, you know, yeah. this will be much faster. So Hopefully. <laughs> well. I mean, it is kind of, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you if you automate it in the end, then it will be. <clears throat> I think the next, you know, just think about it. Yeah, we'll, we'll continue. <laughs> uh, there's a microphone. I'll, I think it's switched on or there's another one, yeah. Oh, this is the mic. You just speak into the oh. black thing there, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you for such a fancy science, I should say. Thank you. Um, I was wondering about the stability of these recombinases in vitro. Uh, have you validated that? Um, I, I wonder too, to be honest. It's very <laughs> interesting. Um, generally, we know that the evolved recombinases uh, they go unstable a bit. So this, this helps kind of because you want the, the recombinases not to be very specific. You want them to widen their, like their capability of, of recombining a certain target site to get to a new, new function kind of. So you need to kind of increase the promiscuity. And I, I assume since it's trained on all this evolved data, probably predictions are also somewhat unstable. Um, but we, what we usually do is we do per, we do evolution to make them more specific and hopefully more stable. But we never did any, you know, studies or in vitro protein studies on stability of the protein. I think also there's no essay to do this. I am not aware. Um, maybe, you know, you can check how, how well it goes into crystal structure or something. I'm not sure, it's not my field. Yeah, since you have challenged nature, so yeah. you should be thinking about it. 
<laughs> Thank you. By the way, you can throw this thing. <laughs> it usually survives if you throw. <laughs> Perfect. Next question, but I just wanted to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I have another question um, regarding the uh, sequence. So in the beginning, you showed that you, from the 3D structure, you actually don't know the domains and their function, what they do. Now you generated different or various uh, protein sequences um, with particular target sequences. So can you now reflect from what you've designed, what domains have what function, and use that information again in designing for novel targets? So this was actually one of the ideas for this project, let's sequence everything and maybe, you know, we, we get a clue of like what mutations are responsible for what and I did a lot of analysis in that direction. Some, uh, it's, it's called um, like direct coupling analysis or something where you study, you know, kind of, it's not correlations, it's, it's co-evolution uh, co of, of the target site and the mutations that you get, you know, what correlates kind of. And uh, I did a lot, and I got just way more confused, and <laughs> I didn't help. It's it's still, it's it's such a it's not like a one to one thing. It's very high order, you know, because the kind of it, it all correlates together. So you change something here, it changes something here. You know, it's not very intuitive. At least as a human, I feel like it's very hard to get some understanding of what the correlations there are. What about sequence length? So the recombinase protein uh, is limited to 300 and something amino acids. Mm -hmm. Have you thought about increasing it or, or shortening it? So the, the evolution method we use actually uh, only the substitutions. So I don't have any data on that. But there are some variants, um, naturally occurring variants of recombinases that do have different lengths and they have some overlapping domains and so on. So there's certainly, there has some sort of effect. Uh, and there's also some evolution methods, although there are very little evolution methods I can introduce in there also something like this could be interesting. But generally speaking, you're safer off just doing substitutions. Yeah. So we never went there. Okay, Nicolas Ponticos, you had another question. I'll just throw the mic to you. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> That's quite nice. And, um, I forgot what I was going to ask now. <laughs> okay, I've got it written down. Maybe I misunderstood. Um, so your um, your uh, algorithm, your um, network, autoencoder, basically takes yeah. as input the um, target, desired target sequence, and then it gives you like the rec suggested recombinase sequences. Is that right? Yes, exactly. Okay. And what you were showing with the latent space, I, I miss, maybe I misunderstood, but I thought you could sample from that latent space as well. Is, are you using that as well, or? Yeah, so um, I'm not doing exactly that. I do try that, and it works. So you can just train a normal variation autoencoder, and it will distribute the, the recombinases according to their sequence similarity, in a way. And that also correlates very much to target site selectivity. But um, it's much harder to find the target site like the recombinases for the target site that you're interested in this way. So you have to sample a lot in this latent space to find something that produces the right output. Uh, and so this, this conditional method where essentially now you're not training, you, you're not training something like this where every region is for a different target site selectivity. It's more like you're learning the distribution in one library and then you're slapping a label onto it. So it's, it's a bit like you have a multi-layer perceptron uh, where basically you put the target site in and then you get the protein sequence out, but in a multi-layer perceptron you would always get the same output because it would just optimize it for the most optimal variant. Uh, but in this way, because we have this, this, this noise input, this normal distribution sampling, um, we get sort of like a sampling like in a library, some from the diversity that it learned from all the mutations that it has in one library. So all the variants that work with this target site, it will help it generate new recombinant sequences variants. So I don't predict one sequence usually, I predict like a thousand or so variants where there's like 20 positions or so that vary a little bit. Great, yeah, thank you. May I ask one, one last question, of <clears> course. 
Um, so basically what you're using is, is the function of the protein, because there's a special, special way here because you have a recombinase, so you can use the, the target changes as a, yeah, a, as a readout for the function of these proteins. Um, two folds of my question. One is how much, what is the compute power you need for that model and how would that you know, compare to, if you think about the structure function predictions by machine learning that is currently done you know, with AlphaFold and so on, which needs enormous in compute power. Yeah. yeah I, mean, I know that's not possible for every protein because here you have a special situation, but if you think about a recombinase that could be done by AlphaFold, to say like, okay, I'll, I'll change something and then yeah. I'll predict by their algorithms compared to what you do. Are you much faster? Are you much more easy? Do you need much less hardware? Just let us know. Way less hardware. It's, it's very, the model is very simple and pretty small actually. Because we're dealing with sequence data and sequence data and also the amount of sequence data is way less compared to what they use for AlphaFold. I mean, they train with the whole Uniprot library or something all of the structural data. I mean, structural data is just way more information than sequence data. Um, so in a sense, this model, I did it on, uh, I mean, it, I needed a graphics card for that, but I didn't need any special graphics card for that. And if I do the leaf one out cross validation, which is like training 89 times, it does take me like, like six hours or something, but it's nothing compared to what you would do with AlphaFold or so on. It would be nice if we could kind of integrate this structural information or generate, because why we use sequence data is basically we don't have the structured data for all of these thousands of recombinant sequences. No, but I would say, you know, the, the other way around, if you don't need that, you yeah. don't need to, because in the end it's more important for you what the function is for this exactly. particular application. So why bothering about the 3D structure? Exactly, so I think this works well enough and 3D structure could probably supplement it in some sense to maybe make the output more reasonable proteins because it's just learning combinations of mutations that are learned from valid proteins but uh, probably you could still improve it a little bit. But I think the gain is probably minimal compared to what you have here. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you again. Well. Applause for you. <laughs> Let me do that in the, in the coffee break, yeah? Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll just leave this, I don't know. Wait. Yeah, oh. that's fine, we'll get this. So the next speaker comes from Kiel, Rana Benales. We know each other very well, we're yeah. doing <laughs> things together, and uh, you will tell us today about precision medicine, cell-resolved approaches to understand complex immune disorders. So we're really changing gears here. Uh, we're going from mutations of the DNA and, and the protein that does that to cells and how we can use genomics to better understand cellular function. Do you see your... Uh, it's in the PDF or the PDF is still AGD 2022. Okay. Okay, great. So hello everyone, uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, uh, my name is Joanne Brunard, I work with Philipp Rosenstiel and today I'm going to talk a bit about uh, if we are on track for precision medicine and if cell resolve approaches can help us understand complex immune disorders. So I also come um, together, so I work very closely together with a CCGA in Kiel. Um, we have like kind of two uh, a lot of genomic analysis up here in the north, and we also have, so most, most closely we work with the UKSA, so the Uni Clinic of Schleswig-Holstein, but we also work together with, for example, the Max Planck for Evolutionary Biology and so on. Um, so we have a lot of different projects, but today I really want to focus on precision medicine and complex immune disorders. So I'm so sorry, this is after lunch, I know, but I just want you to know that there is a great heterogeneity of chronic inflammatory diseases. And this is not only on the whole uh, number of diseases that can be classified as complex uh, inflammatory diseases, but also even within one disease, how it manifests, like what is the phenotype of this disease. And today, to simplify it a bit, I will focus on our uh, um, 
main study uh, that we do, which is uh, inflammatory bowel disease or IBD. So in this case, we include Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Um, these two diseases are very similar in terms of kind of the symptoms that uh, um, the patients have. So there is diarrhea, rectal bleeding, abdominal pain, fatigue, and weight loss. This comes in uh, different uh, disease activities. Um, the main difference between these two disorders uh, is that Crohn's disease can occur throughout the, the gut, while, Crohn, while ulcerative colitis is normally uh, kind of uh, only localized in the colon. Um, there are also some differences in terms of the tissue, but uh, this is kind of what I want you to know. For example, that the Crohn's disease, so you have inflamed tissue really close together with non-inflamed tissue throughout the gut of the patient. And the goal of the IBD treatment is not kind of like to treat, but you treat kind of, uh, you reduce the inflammation to treat the symptom. So you're not treating the symptom, you're treating the inflammation that is occurring. And uh, how it works nowadays in the clinic is like this. So this is the best care treatment that we also provide our patients in the unit clinic in Schleswig-Holstein. So what we have is that the patient comes to the clinic. The patient has a high disease activity. Uh, these can be classified not only by self-assessment scores, also with the clinician scores, but disease activity can also be classified by using, for example, uh, the, the score, endoscopic score done uh, during a colonoscopy on the patient, so the clinician can see how bad and how wide the localization of the inflammation is. But you can also do it kind of like post, so you can also take, for example, a biopsy and do path uh, you send it to pathology in our case, and in this we also have kind of an indication of the inflammatory and the type of inflammation that we can see in the tissue. Uh, so the patient comes, normally they've already been treated with corticosteroids, so what they come with a very high disease activity score. So the first thing that we do is that we uh, uh, give the patient a biological therapy. And biological therapy is already a problem because we have numerous biological therapies available in Germany, even more in the United States, for example, and new therapies keep on coming. So we do not have yet a good sense of what is the like um, biological therapy that is most indicated for a patient when they come. So normally you have one drug that you give, which is like first line of treatment, and you go from there. So in this case, this patient came to the clinic, it got our first line of treatment, which is an anti-TNF, which is also called infliximab. And there are several things that can happen, but in general, this patient can respond or not respond to the therapy. So not respond, you keep high disease activity, respond includes response and remission. So what we call remission is that at very early time points, so this is within the 14 weeks time frame, um, there is a decrease in the disease activity that is like behold a certain t threshold. So the patient is truly feeling much better very early on once you give the, the therapy. I forgot to say that these therapies are normally given intravenously every two weeks. And they're actually, they're very harsh to, to, to the patient. So this is something like if uh, already very early on there is a response, is a very good sign that the patient is actually uh, responding and will keep responding throughout a long period of time. The other layer is that you do not have like this early, early on this decrease in disease activity, but you have a response and this is like as long as you continue to give this therapy, so not every two weeks, but then every month and so on, there is kind of a decrease in the disease and a sustained response after several weeks. But unfortunately, what happens most of the time, the majority of patients, that the patients are not really responding to the biological therapy that we are given. And only 10 to 20% of the patients actually have a long-term benefit uh, from uh, biologic therapy. So what normally happens to these patients, we classify them as non-responders, even though they sometimes have kind of a decrease in the disease activity, but it's not really uh, up to uh, what we want. So these patients are either, normally they are switched to another biologic therapy and so on. But we do, for example, not understand what is the impact of sequential therapy in this case. So this is something that we also want to focus in our studies. But So the best care treatment actually normally looks like this. So upon diagnostic of inflammatory bowel disease, you, there are uh, 
first, for example, you have corticosteroids, there is a, a decrease, and then there is, again, an increase in the disease burden, so you give the biologic treatment and the three things can happen. If it doesn't work, you give another different biological treatment and so on and so forth. Uh, so a patient that suffers from IBD is normally, if there's high activity, is exposed to multiple biologic treatments throughout the course of their life. So there are, I want to say, a lot of caveats that we have right now in IBD treatment. So first of all, it's like when the patient comes to the clinic, we really don't have any kind of uh, idea which would be the most adequate biological treatment for the patient. Sometimes we have, if we do, for example, genotyping preemptively, uh, but ma majority of patients do not have this kind of like a formal identification. Uh, then uh, we also have a problem that the, um, the, we don't have a disease activity score that actually is based on molecular data. So the disease activity is normally like self-assessed or done by the clinician. So um, it could be a little bit biased towards certain clinicians. So it could, uh, it could be very atypical if you go and try to study the disease throughout the world. Uh, so this is something that our group is really trying to tackle, to have this kind of uh, a disease activity score that is solely based on molecular data to see if it can help us somehow. Uh, and then finally, um, there is... Uh, not yet tools to identify remission and non-remission early on. Because with this case, what we want to prevent is that the patient spends a long time uh, in a therapy that is quite strong, and we know that the patient most likely won't respond positively to the therapy that you are given. So, and of course, with this also comes like, if the treatment fails, what comes next? Which therapy should we give next time? So this is also something that we work very hard on, uh, and this following right out is a paper from my colleague Neha Mishra that just came out in Genome Medicine. Um, also, uh, Joaquim is also in this paper, and this is, was one of the great advancements that they have. So what they did was they have this uh, very clear experimental design. They uh, did a longitudinal trial, so they recruited patients. Uh, they were, the patients were given anti-TNF, so this drug that is given most of the times in our clinic, and then data was collected. Uh, so before the treatment is given, and then uh, two weeks, six weeks, and 14 weeks after uh, the treatment. And this data was collected via uh, blood, and with the blood you could do transcriptomics, and they also did DNA methylation profiling. So what we have learned from this trial um, what, uh, first, the, the trial went like identification of differentially expressed genes using transcriptomic data, also identification of differential methylation positions. Um, you kind of um, integrate this too, so this is how you do your feature selection. The feature selection was then screened, so it was mostly focused on this very early on baseline and two weeks after the first treatment. And then uh, included, we had another um, replication cohort, and we use this um, features, to, and we also validate this with a cohort that was um, external, and it was done on microarrays in Crohn's disease patients. And as you could see, once you combine the uh, differentially expressed genes, this is the blue curve, differentially expressed genes with the differential methylated positions, only using 34 features, you actually get quite good in predicting uh, early remission in these patients. Um, this works better for Crohn's disease than it does for ulcerative colitis, also because we could not test very well because the validation cohort was a little bit difficult to get because longitudinal studies are not that common in IBD. So, but uh, this is a great uh, kind of first uh, set of results that we are already using. So we are using in this um, EMAD demonstrator that is called Guide IBD. And what we did is I used some of the features that were discovered by Neha, mainly in differentially expressed genes, and also together with uh, known markers that we have from literature, for example, TREM1 and TNF and o OSM, for example. These are, have been said that they are good in predicting response in IBD treatment. 
So we took this, we took a set of 34, and what we do is that we, okay, the patient comes to the clinic, the patient is biological naive, never had a biological treatment, and first we separate them into two. So the best medical care, which is what I just uh, told you how it's like, and then we classify half of the other patients into molecular medicine care. And what is this molecular medicine care? So what happens in this case is that we use um, blood mainly, but also biopsies from these patients that are taken longitudinally once again. And we use these genes. We do qPCR, very simple. Everybody, anybody could do it in their clinic. And we use um, this to come up with a molecular score. Uh, the molecular score, uh, very simply, is transmitted to the clinicians. Uh, the clinicians are kind of this medicine molecular board. So the, I give them a molecular reports that has my interpretation. And this is very simple. It's just a PCA, and then you have kind of the points of the different times that uh, we have collected. And here you have the expression data from the selected genes. Uh, we normally have blood and biopsy. Biopsy, of course, there's less of them because they're very difficult to collect. Uh, but then uh, what the molecular board, it has an idea actually molecularly, molecularly how the patient is responding together with the things they all already had. So they already had a self-assessed disease activity of the patient and so on. So this is just another layer to inform. Uh, the clinicians, if the patient is responding to therapy or not. And what we hope to achieve, and we already seen very good indications that this is occurring, is that we want to increase the rates of uh, the, the detection of remission early on uh, by doing that we early on identify the non-remitters, and the non-remitters are readily swapped to another biologic therapy. So we do not waste time in treating with a therapy that is not really working. Um, now switching gears and focusing more on the tissue, so in this case focusing on biopsies. Uh, this is a, a paper that came out a while ago by Martin, um, and what they did is that they had these biopsies and they have inflamed and non-inflamed biopsies from Crohn's disease patients, and they did single-cell RNA-seq, try to identify resistance to um, therapy. And they uh, uh, think they identify these cellular models that have uh, myeloid cells, T cells, stromal cells, and plasma cells. And within the expression of the cellular models, they uh, say that they were uh, they could um, predict resistance to anti-TNF treatment. So this is, of course, very sparse, and there has not been any application on, of any such um, uh, score. So we want to contribute more to that. So we also are uh, in this uh, I treat EMAD alliances, and in this case, we are really focusing on the heterogeneity of the tissue because there is something in there, right? You have this gut, you have the intestine uh, epithelium, and in some patches you have inflammation, and just next you have non-inflammation. So what is happening? What is causing this heterogeneity in the tissue itself? Uh, we already have a, like very nice ideas about this, especially given by our colleagues in Hanover. So you could see these two pictures are um, a multiplex immunohistochemistry, and on the left side you have an active IBD uh, biopsy, and on the right side, uh, IBD biopsy of the patient that is undergoing remission already at 14 weeks. And you don't need to know much, you just need to know that, for example, on the right side, you have much less magenta and much less like uh, green, and so, so there is indeed less immune cells present and also not only the presence of the immune cells is important, but what our colleagues think is also the localization and how these immune cells are communicating with each other is important and can also be used to predict remission, early remission in these patients. 
Our help to the study, which is undergoing at the moment, is to uh, not only have these images, which are really nice, but also to do some single cell RNA-seq and also uh, attack-seq in this case, because we think not only the expression is important in this case, but also there might be epigenetic markers within the inflamed and non-inflamed tissue that are different, that are indeed controlling if the tissue becomes inflamed or not. But of course, uh, not it's good to have wishful thinking, but there's also a lot of pitfalls on the way. So one thing that we learn now very hardly, but we keep on trying, is that it's very difficult to work with intestinal biopsies when it comes to single cell RNA-seq. They're very sensitive uh, because, of course, they're very special kind of tissue, which is a barrier, and they do not like to be dissociated. So we just did a simple test, our protocol, um, uh, of cell dissociation that we did do normally in Q and the colleagues in Barcelona with biopsies coming from our clinic did the same protocol and as you can see here on the left side there is not much overlapping so there seems to be a problem so this is by, might be difficult to translate outside. Um, but uh, we keep on trying and another thing that we are doing is also focusing on spatial transcriptomics so in this case um, we started with the big tissue, so instead of starting with the small biopsies, what we started is with colectomies, which is some ulcerative colitis patients when they're very bad disease. There is kind of recession of part of the colon where the inflammation is, and we use this to do spatial transcriptomics. We already have quite nice results, but Special transcriptomics is great, however, it also it's the N, so the number of samples that you can process and kind of compare it can be a very difficult thing to deal with. And also how you uh, have the tissue and how you cut the tissue to put it on a slide is also kind of a, a difficulty to tackle. But we are trying to overcome this, and actually because we cannot work with colectomies, uh, that makes no sense when you have a colectomy you kind of are cured for IBD because you don't have the, pay, the piece of uh, uh, tissue that was uh, diseased. Um, so what we want to do is actually use biopsies in this case. The biopsies are very small and they're very uh, different because they are kind of collected by this pushing method. So they are very different. But we think we can do this and we already kind of have kind of potentially design uh, a thing that uh, you just embed the biopsies there and you can do the cuts and you can kind of stamp several biopsies at the same time in a Visium slide, for example. So um, finally, I think I, I have now explained to you it's very difficult to work with biopsies and not only that, but the patients are also most likely kind of denying to have biopsy, especially taking early on for obvious reasons. Uh, they're very intrusive. So the ideal would be really to have something that we could measure in blood. And this is where this project comes in. Um, so what we have here is we have a, a, a big cohort of IBD patients that were recruited. Um, these patients uh, are treated with two different biologic treatments. And once again, we did this longitudinal assessment. So we collected samples baseline, so before the therapy is given, two weeks after and six weeks after therapy. We had two different therapies, and I think this is kind of the power of this project. So we have the normal anti-TNF, and we have ustekinumab, which is uh, anti-IL-1223, which is normally given as the last line of biologic treatment. So we have these two different tr treatments, and we did single-cell RNA-seq on the PBMCs of these patients. So this is an old UMAP, so now we have over half a million, like 600,000 cells collected. And I just wanted to show you a little bit of the preliminary results that we have seen so far. So we see that monocytes are very important. Uh, not only the quantity of monocytes, but also uh, how they change throughout the treatment and also the molecular alterations that these monocytes are suffering. So we are focusing more on CD14 positive monocytes that also have, for example, HLA positive. And CD16 monocytes are also very interesting in this case. And the cool thing that we find is that we not only find this big difference already a baseline, uh, but we find this um, 
very interesting signal coming from the type 2 interferon that could actually kind of separate um, patients that are responding or not responding to the therapy. And not only this, but different genes that can then also classify if the patient is responding to ustekinumab and is responding to infleximab. So we can already, because of the multitude of data that we have, we can already see very cool patterns that could help us not like could, could help us identify not only the general remission markers, but also kind of uh, drug or biologic specific markers. So the last uh, uh, slide that I have is like, are we on track for precision medicine? I say we are on track, but it's going to be a long way to reach what we want to reach. Um, of course, once you think back on my presentation, everybody knows it will be very impractical to run single cell RNA-seq at the moment. It's an exp expensive technology, and if we do this for every sample that comes from uh, the patients, we might have a problem. So we are thinking of other ways to kind of validate our data, not only, for example, thinking about doing uh, cell sorting followed by qPCR, for example, very simple that method that uh, can be applied not only with us in Q, but in different, uh, in different clinics around the world. Um, we are working on this. Uh, we have, of course, retrospective cohorts that we could see if we see the same signals. Uh, but I think most importantly, we need to have like also access to cohorts that come from other locations, uh, because this is how, really how you find the power and how you can also say that you can implement this in a clinic. And yeah, also um, in, the, in the end, uh, it's also this idea of how uh, circulating immune cells that you see like in the PBMCs are affecting the tissue. This is something that we know little about because either we focus on blood, we focus on biopsy, but we don't focus how is this immune, circulatory immune cells actually affecting the tissue and are they? So this is something that uh, we're still thinking on and working on. Uh, of course, I want to thank uh, Philip Rosenstiel, which is my boss, and all the group uh, here, and also uh, the group from Bonn, and um, all the colleagues from Guide IBD and iTreat, which is this uh, EMED uh, groups that are really working hard, and it's a pleasure to work with them. So thank you. Thank you, Anna. Are there questions? You see the breadth of projects that are there. <clears throat> Thanks for this amazing talk. Uh, it's really interesting to see how um, we get closer to um, personalized medicine. But um, apart from the uh, EKMB, are there any clinics that um, try to implement some of your research into the clinic already? So, for example, with Guide IBD, it's not only us. We normally run the molecular uh, uh, data, so we run the qPCR in Q, but there's Hanover and Hamburg clinics are also associated. And not only that, but I forgot to say, but within this uh, kind of uh, research project, there's also a study on pharmacokinetics and how much uh, giving a drug more or less can actually change the output. So, and these are done by, by colleagues in Saarland. So there is, it, you need a village. It cannot only be us in IKMV. We know not enough. <laughs> Where is the ball going? Yeah, next, oh, that is easy. <laughs> Thanks, that was a, a, a great talk. I have two questions, if you don't mind, mostly because it was a great talk and I'm not an expert in this clinical area. So first, in the models that you did, and I think it was Martin et al., that cell paper, are they taking into account other variables that might be predictive of response? For example, just clinical parameters, age, how advanced the disease is, gender, things like that, or is it purely a biomarker type analysis? That's the first question. The second question, because I've, again, I'm not aware of this field, but to follow up that, are similar approaches being taken in other inflammatory diseases in yours or other centers like lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, others like, like that? So first, first question. Uh, from this paper, Martin and all is 
mainly biomarker creation. So uh, not, you don't see much, especially in IBD, this correlation with clinical parameters. Either you see like clinical, clinical, and which parameters like fatigue and this different types of characteristics can predict disease outcome. But uh, the two, it's uh, not so common. And I think that's also our strong suit because we have the information longitudinally so this kind of creates ways that you could actually correlate and have kind of a, 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 a better kind of pattern to identify. Mm -hmm. uh, the second question, uh, other diseases. Yes. So other diseases, uh, of course. So for example, in 3TR, one of the, the projects that I presented here, uh, what we are trying to do there is not only focus on IBD, but also other inflammatory diseases, SSO lupus, um, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, dermatology. Uh, so not dermatology, but psoriasis in dermatology and der the atopic dermatitis. And we're trying to find kind of general signatures first of like things that are uh, creating the inflammatory disease per se, and then specific to each disease, and then see if we, because a lot of these uh, biologic treatments are actually common for, so for example, anti-TNF is also given to um, rheumatoid arthritis patients and so forth. So it's much more complex and the map is much bigger, but we are trying to tackle this. But it's, yeah, some, some more years of research in this case. Nicolas, do you want to ask your questions? <laughs> it's a triangle. <coughs> oh, be careful. <laughs> Getting used to this now. Okay. Um, yeah, really interesting. I've got okay, millions of questions, but I'll, I'll start with uh, one. Um, yeah. So, how, the tr what's the current treatment strategy? Uh, I, again, I'm you know, new to this area as well. So, what's the current treatment strategy for IBD with Biologic? Uh, it depends. So in Germany, mm -hmm. uh, first of all, first line corticosteroids, and then you also can change the corticosteroids, uh, the amount that you give in a different types. And then once you go through the biological uh, therapies, uh, the first one you give is normally anti-TNF according to the regulations that we have of now uh, from the German government. And, and how frequently um do you treat, do you patients come in or do you wait for them to get worse before they come in again? Or So I understand the idea is to know before they're getting worse, to get them to come in sooner. I, I guess that's one of the things you want to do, right? Yeah, so this is, uh, we have an outpatient clinic, which is great help. So we follow these patients basically once they come to the cl clinic throughout their lives. So they always have assessments. Even if the patient is under remission, they will be assessed six months after therapy, one year, two years, and so on. We do not know yet how to uh, uh, say like, oh, this patient's gonna have a flare soon. We don't have this kind of idea yet. We know how we can identify a continuous flare, so a non-response, high disease activity, but we are still kind of, um, oblivious of having this one thing that can help us identify that the patient's going to have a flare. But there are, I think there are clues out there, especially I think it's very interesting, the fatigue studies that are being done at the moment. And I think this could also be something that, so clinical data that could help us look for the right time for us to do any type of molecular assessment. Mm -hmm. Or, or just maybe regular blood tests. I don't know if that's happening already. Uh, yeah, so, so every bit. time the patient comes to the clinic, but sometimes even, it happens in between. So if the yeah. patient feels bad, they right away come to the clinic, but then normally it's a little bit too late. Okay, I was thinking about more local sort of blood tests that could be done. Like in, uh, they, they don't have to come to the hospital for that. Like they can do them. Ah, yeah. yeah so we also try to have uh, like the clinics around, yeah. not only in the uni clinic, not only in the like the hospital clinic, but the clinics around us in Schleswig-Holstein to kind of participate in our studies and also like if they see like crazy CRP or something like that, they will right away say, I think it's time to go to the clinic and so on. Yeah, well, thank you very much for this comprehensive overview and and. 
together with the new data. Thanks yeah. again. Thank you. So we now, now turn west to the West German Genome Center, and uh, Dennis uh, Lal will present us a comprehensive genome, genomic biomarker discovery in patients with common and rare epileptic brain lesions. So we're changing gear and shift again. Just a second. Until he brings this all up, Johan, I, I might add something, you know, that the problem in these chronic inf inflammatory diseases is as big as in cancer. The only difference is that we have neither the resources nor the infrastructures like cancer centers. So it's very simple in my mind, uh, having worked in both areas now, if the same infrastructure would be there, this would be much more advanced. Now it's all yours, Dennis. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for giving the opportunity today to um, speak. And I would love um, also to talk um, about a little bit um, about machine learning or more medicine-related topics, um, but um, unfortunately I will have to talk about somatic mutations, which is also actually, I think, a good thing. Okay. These are my conflicts of interest. I think none of them have, have anything to do with the topics I will talk about today. And um, we can therefore directly jump in. So um, just uh, before I start talking about um, the brain-specific tissue um, analysis, um, I will give um, you some backgrounds about the disease and also the genetics of epilepsy which is, um, as a basic scientist, actually uh, super cool to work on because you can find any kind of genetic and environmental factors which can cause the disease. Because not, um, as a whole, it's a big mixed bag of different um, etiologies, which um, some of them have a purely genetic component, and you know, nothing is pure, right? But um, some are more like environmental driven. If you have a car crash and half of your brain is still there, then you probably also have epilepsy. Um, but it's less genetic, I would, cause, I would say, unless you have like a genetic, pre genetic predisposition to drive aggressively. But, uh, you know, there's um, a lot of things to think about. So, and then I will talk a little bit more specific about this DFG-funded project and um, show you also at the end some um, work in progress <clears throat> and future directions. So, here, just to um, bring everyone on the exact same knowledge what I have, that you have to only understand this slide. It's, so there are people who don't have seizures, and this is um, the majority of us. And um, those individuals um, will um, at least don't um, actively ex um, realize that they have a seizure. But actually, many of us will have a seizure during the night, and nothing happened a few times in our life. And around about 20% of children have febrile seizures. So they have fever, and um, after a while, then it's fine, and nothing to, to worry about. But there are individuals who have um, epilepsy, which is um, defined as having unprovoked seizures, two at least. And some of them, and they are typically distinguished between, um, okay, they are, they are typically distinguished between the type of seizure. So if it's um, in a specific area, so you can narrow it down with, um, you know, the technology neurologists have, um, or if it's across the whole brain. So this is um, and it's an important concept um, to understand and because I will talk later quite a bit about the focal ones. And the other thing is how um, neurologists distinguish the epilepsies is also by the, the comorbidities. So um, how, um, you know, how unaffected an individual is by other factors or if the individual is very challenged in many ways, like having a lot of depression their whole life, or is unable to um, participate in daily tasks without the help of a third person. And um, another one factor is where um, epileptologists um, like to distinguish different types of epilepsy if, if they respond to therapeutics or not. So um, this is the big picture. So and overall, um, people are um, very heterogeneous in, in, in these categories. So from a genetics perspective, um, the, um, we have also quite a bit of different um, observations. This is um, from a study which we have currently in review, 
where we performed um, a very large um, copy number variation study, so where we looked at losses or gains of large genomic segments in the genome um, from, I think this was 30,000 people with epilepsy. It's a big international community effort against like 600,000 controls. And we find 35 regions um, in the genome where if you have a loss or too much, um, so um, loss is on the top and bottom is um, um, too much, so gains of genomic segments. When you have a strong predisposition, and strong is here, it's written in the odds ratio, 5 to 40 fold, towards um, having epilepsy in your life. And but this is not typically the person which you would expect to be in, for example, in this audience. These are typically more early onset epilepsies where they also have other cognitive um, disabilities. So another um, type of genetic factor which can play a role in people with epilepsy are rare single nucleotide variants which are not um, uh, uh, common um, single nucleotide variants which um, many of us will also carry but to, together as an aggregate, um, they will con confer, let's say, fourfold risk and as in a form of a polygenic risk um, score to um, epilepsy. And this is really particularly common um, for the so-called generalized epilepsies. When the whole brain is affected, it seems that you have a higher chance um, of having a high polygenic risk score. So, and then there's these really, really severely disabled children so which are unable to um, have children themselves. They are, most of them are actually dependent their whole life on um, a, their parents or a um, caregiver. And most of them um, are unable to really learn and speak even. So they're often called epilepsies, but, in, in often, but you could also call them neurodevelopmental disorders um, with seizures. It's not inexchangeable, but um, for the sake of this talk, um, these are, is a very severe, um, different disease, and if you would see children like this, you would probably just call them an epilepsy patient, you would call them more complex syndrome. And here we have around about um, 150 um, genes identified in the last 10 years, so where the people have um, almost everyday epilepsy. And um, the, you already can see that it's quite a you know, large list which is increasing um, significantly every year. And it's really hard um, for physicians to um, um, use this information because with every gene you have some spit and, um, prognostic or diagnostic information and um, some of them have um, very strong um, um, treatment opportunities already today. Um, not anything which modifies the cause of the disease and, and yet, but still you can improve the quality of the, um, of the individual, but you have to have the knowledge for every gene how to use this, and that's a big problem because no one has that. So, but you can um, uh, mesh them into major categories, and you see that um, the ion channel group is um, the main category in epilepsy. So, um, um, since the, you know, the evolution, since exome sequencing was so strong and um, uh, was so successful in epilepsy that it has been, you know, applied to clinical um, care very fast and since discovery of the few epilepsy genes now, it's pretty much routine in the Western world at least to do um, gen genetic sequencing and typically the one in five to one in three um, individuals who receive a genetic test will get a diagnosis um, from that. And the more comprehensive the genetic test, um, the more higher the chance that um, you find something which can explain at least a large fraction of the disease. But just to um, look at these numbers, they seem already quite high, uh, at least to me, um, given that we only know these genes since 10 years and we are still finding ones. But these tests don't look at short tandem repeats or they, they're not really suited to look at more complex genomic rearrangements. They don't measure any kind of um, family planning risk or um, what is the risk type, polygenic type of um, um, epilepsies. It's, not, it's all not in these tis, tests which are clinically done. So there's way more to identify for the epilepsies. So here's like, just a brief summary. So you can think about this as um, a disorder where you have a very large monogenic component or like a monogenic plus modifier component. You, so on the one hand, some syndromes are really pretty much determined. You have the variant in that gene or a specific, also a specific type of variant. And if you would line up the individuals who have that, they would look like a syndrome. You would, they would really look all like one another. 
But there are some where the variant causes for sure the epilepsy and a very bad epilepsy, but if you then um, line up the individuals who have the variants, they look quite heterogeneous. And some can be um, um, attributed to the allelic um, difference of the function of different alleles, but some also um, due to modifying factors. And then we have this intermediate variants or copy number variants, which give you a strong risk, but not necessarily 100% penetrance. And then we have also more the polygenic factors, um, which give you more fourfold risk to, towards developing the epilepsies. And there's a lot of re um, research going on. So, and the interesting thing was, um, you basically for almost all types of a little bit more severe epilepsies, you find um, something genetic. It's um, in the last 10 years, it's really, um, you know, a big evolution and a big um, um, change of the community also. Um, imagine there was no genetics and suddenly there's everywhere genetics. But there was one um, group of in type of epilepsies where there was not too much to be identified besides um, like a few syndromes which I ignore now, like tuberous sclerosis. There are, and these were the lesional epilepsies. So those where you find something um, really abnormal looking in the MRI, um, but Somehow, if you look at the families, they typically don't really segregate. It's mostly, they're more sporadic, but you don't identify these de novo mutations, which have explained a lot for the very bad other types of epilepsies, which are non-lesional. So, and somehow, um, we as a community ignored um, the fact that um, this is a very similar thing like um, you observe for glioblastoma or other brain tumors that it might be the case that um, you have mutations, but they're not in the blood, but they're in the brain. Somehow no one was making that leap over the last 20 years. So, but finally people made um, the connection and turns out that um, almost all of these abnormal things which are in the brain, they are genetic. And they are not germline genetic, they are genetic um, only um, somatically, so they happen during development. And you have then the mutation which is in the brain and if, uh, in, the, in the brain, and, but you don't detect it if you do a blood test or a saliva test. You have to um, resect the tissue, um, take a, um, a piece of the tissue and sequence that. And um, for people who have a focal epilepsy, so where it's coming from one direction of the brain, and um, you can apply, you have either from um, MRI level, um, the evidence that it's coming really from that side or from EEG, so, from electrodes from the brain, or even from invasive EEG, like stereo EEG, where you put like, even electrodes in the brain, or MEG, where you have um, also, we can also measure where abnormal activity is happening in the brain. Typically, all these things are done together. Then you can localize often and make, make a really educated guess where the epilepsy is. And when you feel really comfortable about this, then typically neurosurgeons cut it out. And Around about seven out of 10 times, depends on the epilepsy, this is then removing the epilepsy almost completely. Let's say almost completely. So good enough that people feel good that it was a thing worth doing. But, um, but the good thing is, um, some of the centers, and here in Bonn is, is there for sure, and other centers um, are collecting brain tissue. And so finally geneticists came to the conclusion it might be worth looking at these tissues and when suddenly they sequenced them and then noticed, okay, actually there are mutations which, which explain the disease. Um, what people also notice is, um, is these are similar mutations you find in all kinds of cancer, but this looks different because they just hit neurons and neurons are not just crazily proliferating like other than tissues, they just migrate often weirdly and um, you have basically a similar kind of disease. So these were the initial studies, but um, they had the problems that they were more done in a um, small genetic type of style and looking like at a um, few patients um, with, like, in a small gene panel because you have to sequence really deep. So in, in contrast to tumors, um, these mutations have, um, affect only few neurons of, of a big tissue block. So you need to have um, a really high coverage type of approach, which is super expensive to identify them. So there were no large scale projects. So which comes down to um, our um, um, application to the DFG um, for the NGS um, Competence Center, where we applied um, for a, a massive sequencing project at the end. That's the, the numbers don't so, so big, but for example, in this first project, which I shown you uh, in a second is we have sequenced 500 deep exomes, 
which um, um, a deep exome has in this case around about 330x coverage. And you can basically multiply the cost of this average exome times six or five, depending how deep, deep you typically go. And that's some very expensive per sample. And so, um, so we did this, and if you're interested, this is in the bio archive or medical archive. Um, so here, just to bring you back again, so it's a really important question because um, one in three people are um, um, pharmacoresistant. They have the lifelong epilepsy, and most of them have also severe depression. Um, they are really un unable to function as a person in society because um, imagine if you could not, would not know if you go out and suddenly you have an, a seizure. And um, this is um, particularly affecting here the focal ones where you have a local um, um, EEG signature. These are also very heterogeneous disorders. You see something in the MRI, but sometimes it's a, just a low-grade um, tumor, so which is not becoming malignant and it's very slowly growing. Nothing is, you don't, you're not, worried that, not really worried that this thing will metastasize, but you are, um, at some point it grows and you have daily seizures, which are pharmacoresistant. Or you have um, hippocampal sclerosis, which is a more um, an inflammatory type of disease where the hippocampus gets smaller. Or you have these malformations, so you, you have areas of your cortex which look weirdly shaped. And um, all of these are mainly, basically mainly neuronal um, phenotypes. So, and th there have been a couple of genes identified before, but no one has, done, has looked at the copy number um, variant state at that state, and no one looked exome wide. So no one did statistics to identify genes. Um, for these genes, everyone had just a good feeling and look, made a panel of 20 genes for the genes they felt are good to look at. And um, so we felt it's good, a good um, opportunity to do a more um, um, yeah, large-scale approach where we don't, uh, which is a little bit more hypothesis-free. So, and um, so yeah, a little bit more details about um, um, the field in this publication. So. Okay, same limitation which I just mentioned. So the, the study design um, was relatively simple. We look at 500, um, exome, um, um, t uh, 500 deep exomes, look for somatic variants, yeah, and then replicate in 1,000 um, samples. And this is really important to understand that this is a, a, something which is really rare, right? So the largest study um, which has been published before on this same type of disorder had um, at that point in time um, I think 80 um, tissue samples. So the, um, this is, and this only works because we have with um, Erlangen, the, um, the European Biobank as a collaboration partner, this is Ingmar Blümke, who is also PI of this um, study. And um, we have um, uh, with Cleveland Clinic, and that's me in that case, um, the largest epilepsy surgery center on this planet. Um, and Otherwise, um, it's hard to get to, to these um, brain tissue samples, as you can imagine, and these numbers. So this is the yeah, cohort, and nothing fancy about this. But the good thing is that um, we have, um, it's particularly from the Cleveland Clinic cohort, all the uh, um, stereo EEG, MEG, um, EEG, MRI, and so on clinical um, biomarker which is um, something which is really important then to consider about the surgery outcomes later on. So because, I, as I mentioned before, only around about seven out of 10 are um, ep uh, um, epilepsy-free after the surgery. And there's a lot of questions if the surgery really cut off all um, you know, mutated cells or um, was the, seizure, um, the epilepsy not really localized and some um, post hoc analysis are currently in development. So I think to this audience, I don't need to talk about how sequencing works and how you detect somatic mutations. I skipped that a little bit in the sake of time. So just one thing what we, um, so this is the first time someone did like a comparison like this. So we can show that um, the, um, um, the, the lesional epilepsy acidic tumors, so the green ones, so these are the tumors. Um, they are basically tumors, so not surprising, but um, these type of tumors, are, not typically coming through the oncology side. They're coming through the epilepsy center because no one is afraid of malignancy because they're so slow growing. And typically the patients are fine. They're, these are children. But um, at some point they have these seizures and then they don't, don't go to an oncologist, they go to an epileptologist. And so that's why they end up in this type of study and they're not typically not studied at all in the oncology field. 
So, and we see here that they have way more mutations. So this is like an exome-wide mutation burden. The malformations a little bit more in hippocampus growth, not really. We see that the tumors are also enriched for um, pathogenic variants if you filter for um, them. We see that the allelic fraction is higher, so meaning um, if you um, take a DNA sample, that you have more mutated cells in the tumors and, and then in the malformations, which makes sense because the tumors are a growing disorder, whereas the malformations are a migration disorder. And um, we see that um, CNVs are also really um, um, yeah, going crazy in the tumors, but not in the other diseases. So, yeah. So um, overall, we can take now this data set and we can apply some statistical approaches to um, identify novel genes. There are some approaches which measure um, how many mutations you, do, um, you identify in an exome and see uh, across your cohort if there are some genes which are higher uh, burden of mutations. And with this, you can generate these QQ plots which measure the number of mutations per dot, and the dot is a gene which you observe versus you what you would expect by chance. And there's also some additional magic happening depending on which gene and, and what kind of um, cell expression signature that gene has in a tissue, tissue which, you have to, which you have to give it as a covariate. But anyway, so as a long story short, we um, could um, identify um, several genes which are associated with the malformations or, um, and the lesional epilepsy genes. And the good and the bad um, observation of this is that out of around about 20,000 human genes, <clears throat> we could identify as the top genes the genes which have been already identified by biologists without statistics, which is always, I guess, like a good um, um, validation um, of the statistics that if your top hit is already an established one, just to know that everything before was hypothesis, hypothesis driven. No one looked exome wide. So, but we also can identify um, with PTPN11 um, a new gene for the low grade um, epilepsy uh, associated tumors and with NRAS, um, a gene for um, the malformations which have not been shown before. Um, in addition, we can also look now at these, um, on these oncoplots where we can see now here on the uh, different um, malformations uh, or the pathologies and you can see that some of them like hemimegacephaly have almost 80% um, um, positive rate. Um, this is a very large malformation. And you can see um, also for genes like um, the mTOR gene and the focal cortical dysplasias or in the ganglioglioma, but it's already, this was already well established, you see strong genotype phenotype correlations. So where specific genes are very often mutated. And, and even in, if you go back to the tissue and you, feel, uh, and you sometimes have to even reclassify them. So here, um, this is, but it's a different topic, but we can also work with the pathologist and um, have genetics as a second opinion for the pathology. And um, again, this work is, um, is in, uh, online in the medical archive. So um, as a next step, we um, wanted to um, look at um, a gene, pan the gene panel based on the um, exome data we have. So, we looked at all genes which have a somatic variant. This were 122 in our in initial discovery study and see um, if we can um, sequence way cheaper in a thousand um, samples than, um, um, yeah, additional samples. So, and at the moment we have um, um, sequenced 187 and um, 200 or more are already sequenced but not analyzed yet and we are sequencing 500 more by the end of this year. And here's the uh, composition, but just to just have a very um, brief um, um, teaser into the data. Suddenly it doesn't want anymore. Okay. Let's see. So we, you can see here for comparison the um, results from the exome um, data and always in comparison to the panel data. And we just um, selected here now the genes which were in the exome significant um, or the most mutated ones. And we see that's basically the same gene. So hippocampus sclerosis was um, negative basically in the exome, which is probably a very different type of disease. Makes also s sense post hoc. But um, the tumors, so the, lung, uh, the lesional epilepsy-associated tumors, 
as well as the malformation of cortical development, the same top genes um, or with genes which were frequently mutated in the exomes are also frequently mutated um, in the um, uh, panels. So we can then use this data and run again our statistics. So on the left, you see the statistics we did for the exome analysis. And here to the right, you see um, if we perform now in the panel, this the same type of statistics. We can um, validate, for example, SSC35A2 and M2 in this independent data set that they come up as um, genes with an unusual high burden. Um, I have to say that the, um, the QQ group needs to be better calibrated because we only have now 122 genes and it's very easy to deviate from the um, line now, but it's again, work in progress. But it's good that to see that these genes are the top ones again. It's just the order of things. I think that's an interesting observation. And then we can combine this exome data now with the panel data and um, have suggestive evidence for that PDE for the IP and EGFR are genes to consider for the malformations of cortical development, which makes, makes, make also sense because they all fit in the same pathways for the, compared to the genes we have um, seen before. And this is typically mTOR pathway and MAP, MAP kinase pathway. So back again, this is work in progress. So um, as I mentioned before, we are sequencing um, way more, uh, well, th we're finishing the sequencing of way more this year. Uh, so, and, no. Can I go reverse? No, I cannot go reverse. Okay. So, and we also have done um, deep genomes, which is super expensive. One sample, $10,000 uh, euros. Um, so, um, for, to explore if some of those negative samples, if they, if this is an issue of the um, just sequencing technology, um, and, or if there is like a, a large structural variant which um, the exomes or the panels cannot find. Um, and luckily we also got um, a large US grant um, to sequence way more um, patient samples now on a global scale um, and do for 100 um, samples also single nuclei um, RNA sequencing um, yeah, RNA sequencing for so those which are ge um, genetic defined. <laughs> And we also do now a lot of clinical genetic analysis, and particularly co-registration of the tissue, which we ex extracted with the, M with the MRI post-surgery um, to understand if that is correlated with outcomes. And yeah, with this, I hope I can convince you that um, somatic variants play a role in epilepsy, and I'd like to thank everyone who contributed. Mm -hmm. Are there questions? Over there, please. Uh, very, very interesting topic. Uh, thank you very much. Is, you, you're looking at a lot of um, mutations, single nucleotide variants, and copy number variations, and so on. Is, is a methylation or some, some epigenetic changes, do you think it also plays a big role if it uh, you know, changes the expression of some genes, it probably could influence this as well? Mm, yeah, so definitely methylation is probably the best choice if you want to develop a classifier um, to get rid of the pathologist long term. Um, there are already good examples from um, other brain, uh, brain tumors, and there's also preliminary, uh, or actually good studies even for epilepsies. I don't know um, in terms of therapeutics um, if the methyl transferases or if, there's, if this is a valid strategy. I think everyone who works on this will say yes, um, but, uh, but there's no good example at least from the field where I am in at the moment. Um, but for uh, classification, it's way better than genetics um, to, if you just want to have a path pathology classification in an automated way. Thanks. Time for one more question. I think there was one. No, the, I think he was. Oh, yeah, please. I already asked this time. And then, <laughs> or, we'll oh. pass it. Well, before asking a question, I wish to leverage a short comment, a brief comment. 
From it, in its inception in 2009 or 2010, the polygenic risk model was under fire with very good reasons, from population genetics, from statistics, from evolutionary medicine. See, from genetic side, that is a, that is a fishy concept. And criticism never stops with that. However, the drive toward that was irresistible, obviously. And it was very, 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 very prominent, and thousands of papers have been published until two years before. There are very earnest critical papers which deny the possibility of that. And I would like to mention that very briefly, that one is by Wald and Nicholas Wald, that is a famous one in London who made these, uh, these, uh, these uh, neurodevelopmental disease stories with an with a, with a open, open spine and so on. So, so he, is, he knows what to talk about. And the title of that paper reads roughly, The Illusion of Polygenic Risk Prediction. Okay, that was one paper. The second paper was by Ilya Eihag from Lund University. And he had a closer look to the methodological background and postulated that probably thousands of papers had to be revised because they are probably highly biased by methodological deficits. It has been published in May or so, and we are all, the, the community is waiting for the response to that. And the third paper is from Françoise Clarget d'Apou, the grand old lady of genetic French genetic epidemiology. And there was a, in Paris, a, the IGES, um, a big IGES meeting this year, and she gave a talk, and the title was roughly about the false dawn of polygenic risk prediction. So I think the story is over with polygenic risk. Well, but one of your slides, uh, or two of you, you showed that slide twice. Mm -hmm. It was just before that one. Uh, there you had poly that, there you divided polygenic risks in polygenic one, two, and three. Okay, and maybe you, you, you concur with me that polygenic three is a lost case. It's a dead, it's a dead case. It's a, it's, at least I believe that. But what about polygenic two and polygenic one? I'm re and that is my question. Mm -hmm. At these places, one would expect that you could demonstrate gene interactions or variant interactions. And that is exactly my question. Are you able to, in, in any of these cases, polygenic one or polygenic two, to demonstrate convincingly gene interactions? Yeah, so, so this is not directly to the talk I gave, um, but um, so there are um, good examples. It's, it's not a directly one-to-one -one gene interaction, but since we know that um, um, you know to generate a polygenic score, one has to consider um, LD, um, LD pruning so that the SNPs are independent from another, that they're not on the same haplotype. Um, one could just by default, assume if you look at 20,000 or so SNPs that there are, the, there are many genes involved, um, that there's good examples where people have like a, for example, rare variant, and the, um, for example, the 20Q 11.2 um, deletion is a really good example for this, which gives high risk for schizophrenia, and that the level of um, cognitive performance uh, measured by, um, prospectively by um, um, specific um, normalized scales is dependent on the polygenic burden of those individuals, and which is measured then, I think, to 40,000 variants from an IQ GWAS. Um, so I, to me, you know how high you want to put this on this scale, in this, anyways, the schema. Um, to me, there are very good examples um, that polygenic background can be measured and also risk assessed um, in individuals. Um, I don't know if that answers your question directly, um, but um, I, I think my talk is not a debate about polygenic risk in general, but I personally want to give the statement that I definitely um, think, and we have also a study where we twice replicated blindly um, a higher um, genetic burden in individuals with epilepsy compared to controls, um, that this is a thing, um, but I guess it's a matter of debate and 
to you, I guess. I think, I think as, a, as a chair, I'm going into, I think Thomas made a very important point about new developments in this area. Um, and I think that's something we should really continue in the coffee break because it becomes philosophically about the direction of genetics as a whole field at the moment. And I would not bring the burden only to Dennis because uh, I think you have used that in, in good faith of a lot of history, but we have seen it in science over and over again that we have to somehow rephrase things if there is new ideas coming up. I agree with Thomas, we need to discuss that, mm. but in, um, probably with Dennis and others in the coffee break um, and continue here. Um, I thank you, Dennis, for the intro into uh, a technical undertaking, you know, sequencing to a death and, and bringing such project forward in a number of patients that is um, you know, far beyond what has been done before. I think that's uh, from the technical perspective where we will see this in, in fields. Cancer is much ahead of us, but now we see it goes into directions like epilepsies as well, which you basically brought us to that this is important and it's not only for cancer. There's many other diseases where these kind of things are important. But the discussion about polygenic risk scores is beyond your talk today. Um, but I, I would be happy to see whether we can start a discussion at the coffee break about this. And with that, I would like to go to the last talk of the competence centers because before we have another one from Illumina then, uh, is Fubo Cheng from the NGS Competence Center in Tübingen. Here you are. And you want to present our systematic approaches to decipher gene regulatory mechanism, another level of demonstration what genomics can do. And we're looking forward to your talk. to the audience. You can also ask the questions on the platform and the speakers may answer to it later on. I cannot open it, I don't know. Thank you very much for giving me the chance to present my data here. So uh, actually in our facility, the NGS Computer Center Tübingen, we have established many different uh, NGS techniques like uh, ChIP-seq, RepSeq, RNA-seq, single-seq RNA-seq, high seq and capture high seq and so on. So to characterize the gene regulatory mechanisms. Um, so my research focused on focused on two different neurological diseases. The first is primary dystonia is also a kind of movement disorder. And the second dis disease is Parkinson's disease. So in order to characterize the mechanism of this disease, we can use samples from patients. For example, we can use the brain tissue samples. We can use iPS cells from the patient. Uh, also, we can use the cell models or even animal models from the, uh, for the disease. So use these samples, we can uh, we can do back rna -seq or single-cell rna -seq, so to find out the differentially expressed gene. But the problem is um, how this gene will dysregulate, so what is the mechanism? And also the second question is what we could do from the differentially expressed gene. So can we find some treatment for the disease? Uh, so first I would like to briefly introduce the DIT6 dystonia, it's um, caused by mutation in the SAP1 gene. <coughs> Actually, SAP1 is a transcription factor. It has a SAP domain, it is a, a zinc fixed structure. So, in order to uh, characterize the mechanism of this disease, we collect the fibroblasts from the patient. So, you can see here. Um, Okay, uh, this is a control fibroblast, and also there are some patient fibroblasts. So we found that the SOD2 protein is much lower in step one patient fibroblasts. And so we want to know why this uh, SOD2 protein level is lower. So we performed chip seq used anti step one antibody. We found that step one can bind to the promote region of SOD2. So you can see here that SOD2 have many different isoforms, but SAP1 can bind to almost all the isoforms. 
And next, we perform the separate report AC. So we clone this uh, SOD2 promoter to drive the expression of this uh, LAC2 gene, uh, uh, to drive this luciferase gene. So to measure the luciferase gene activity, we can see the activity of the promoter. Here, we use the tosinate as a control because we know Zepan can repress the activity of tosinate promoter. And then we uh, clone this SOD2 promoter and perform luciferase. We found that Zepan can upregulate the uh, activity of SOD2 promoter. So from here, we can see that Zepan directly regulates the expression of SOD2, but uh, life is always, it's not always like easy, like that easy. So, uh, in order to characterize the mechanism of uh, step one dystonia, we used a cell model. This SHSY5Y neuronal cell model, we used CRISPR Cas9 to knock out uh, the step one gene, and we found the protein level is, is lower in this knockout cell line. And then we performed step one chip seq, and also RNA seq used this uh, step one mutant cell line. So we uh, use chip seq, we can find a lot of target gene, and then we map, we compare the step one target gene with this differentiated express gene. Actually, we found only like 10% gene, uh, differentiated genes are target gene of step one. So that means step one tagged only a very small number of uh, differentiated express gene detecting step one mutant cells. Uh, so in order to find out how the other genes were dysregulated, we used an epigenetic approach. So we did chip seq of H3K27 isolation and H3K4 trim isolation. Uh, this H3K27 isolation is a marker for active enhancer, and this H3K4 trim isolation represents the activity of the promoter. So it is also correlated to the expression level of the gene. Um, should we compare the control cell line and the step one cell line for the histone modification, for the changes of histone modification? And we picked up the top regions that has changed the histone modification. For example, here we picked up like 600 regions. Here we picked up uh, about around 500 regions. And then we did motif discovery analysis. So what we want to know to find the common motif of this, these regions. And then we found different uh, uh, common mo um, motifs. For example, here is the different H3K27 motif, and here is the H3K4 uh, trim isolation motif. So we compare this motif with the um, motif of the transcription factor. And very interesting, we found that SP1 matched quite well with all these motifs. And also, we tested the protein level of SP1 in our SEP1 mutant cells, we found the increased expression of SP1. So that means SEP1 regulated the expression of genes might, might di indirectly to SP1. So we further uh, did SP1 chip seq, and we found a lot of target gene of SP1, but we also found that, uh, almost half of this dysregulated gene are the target gene of, of SP1. Um, next, we further knocked out SP1 in our SEP1 mutant cells, so we generate a, a double mutant cells, so with heterodox SEP1 knockout and homodex knockout SP1, and then we perform RNA-seq. So here, this is the RNA-seq data of double mutant cells, and here is the SEP1 single mutant cells, and then we found almost half of these genes uh, recovered to normal level, that means uh, if we further knock out SP1 in SEP1 mutant cells, we can rescue the expression of uh, half of the gene. So we suppose that SP1 might be a potential treatment target for SEP1 dystonia because we, there are some drugs can, can be used to, um, to downregulate the expression of SP1. The second disease I'm focusing on is the Parkinson's disease. Actually, Parkinson's disease is the second most common neurodegenerative disease. Um, it affects about 1% of uh, population over 60 years. And the typical pathological change is Lewy bodies in the brain. So here is the staining of the Lewy body. Uh, here I am. And also, people found, 
Uh, the alpha nuclei is the main component of the Lewy body. And some study also found that overdosage dosage of alpha nuclei causes PD. Uh, for example, here, the two papers found that triplication or a duplication both can cause the PD or familiar PD. And also research also found that manipulations of synuclear level have demonstrated a beneficial impact for, the, uh, for PD. Actually, in our study, we, we found that we used this IPS differentiated middle brain dopaminergic neuron from SEP1 patient and also from controls. So we found here uh, in SEP1 patient, the SO, uh, the synuclear protein level is quite lower compared to control. And we also collect the uh, human front cortex tissue from SEP1 patient. We found the protein level is also, is also decreased here. Um, so it means that SEP1 may also regulate the expression of alpha nuclear. Uh, so we performed chip seq use SEP1 antibody. So we found a weak uh, binding on the promote, on the nuclear promoter, but... Okay, so um, we also performed H3K27 isolation, uh, chip seq so we compared the control cells, and here this is the SEP1 knockout cells we found two enhancers in this intronic region. For example, here this is enhancer one region, and here this is enhancer two regions. So we found when we knock, knock down step one, the enhancer activity just decreased drastically. So um, in next step, we would like to see whether this enhancer can really contact with the promoter and to regulate the promoter activity. For this purpose, we uh, established a um, sequence method we call it 4 c uh, It's a circular chromosome conformation capture and sequencing. In this experiment, we use the restriction enzyme. Uh, we, we use the restriction enzyme to digest this. We first crosslink the cells and then use the restriction enzyme to digest this chromatin and then uh, ligate it again to form a big circle of the uh, of the DNA, and then we use the second restriction enzyme to cut the cut the DNA again, and then we got we got a small fragment, and then we ligate again. So here, if we look this region and to want to know which region contact to this region, we can we can use a primer to do PCR and to to amplify this blue blue fragment. So and then we do next generation sequences. So in this experiment. Experiment we did for the sake used the synuclear promoter as the viewer point, and then we found that some regions have uh, uh, activity in uh, interaction activity with the promoter. For example, there's some uh, including this enhancer region, enhancer one and enhancer two, and also a promoter region of another gene. Uh, here, this is the raw rates. I show it. You can see here this is the peak in this enhancer two region. Uh, and we also uh, did for the sake use this uh, CDCF knockout cells because uh, in CDCF chip sake we saw that CDCF can bind to the to the promoter and also the enhancer regions. So want, we want to know whether CDCF mediates this enhancer promoter contact. So when we knock out CDCF, we find this peak almost uh, disappears. That means CDCF indeed mediates this promoter and uh, enhancer contact. And then next, we, we want to know whether this enhancer can affect the activity or uh, affect the expression of alpha nuclear. So we use, we use CRISPR-Cas9 system to knock out the enhancer one or enhancer two. And then we test the protein level of alpha nuclear. Uh, so when we knock out the enhancer one, we found slightly decreased uh, protein level of alpha nuclear. But, but when we knock out enhancer two, we found a drastically decreased the protein level of alpha nuclear. So this experiment showed that both enhancer can indeed regulate the expression of alpha nuclear. And then we also used another method to prove that the interaction between synuclear promoter and the enhancer. Here you can see we, we use a synuclear promoter to drive the expression of luciferase gene, and then downstream of the 
Lucifer stream, we use this uh, enhancer, enhancer one or enhancer two or some control fragment. And then we did Lucifer's report AC, this is control. And then when we add the enhancer one region, the promoter activity increased a little bit. But if uh, we use the enhancer two region, we found the, the promoter activity increased uh, largely. Um, so this experiment is also consistent with our uh, enhancer knockout experiment. So we, we can see that this enhancer can indeed um, regulate the expression of uh, alpha synuclear. Uh, we also analyze the, the, this enhanced activity in different cells. For example, we, we did chip seq use the IPS cells, IPS differentiates neuroprogenic cells, and IPS differentiates the neuron. So we found this enhancer, this, this enhancer activated among, and during the differentiation. And also we tested the activity in cerebellum and the cortex, and we found that this enhancer is highly activity in the brain, so form an uh, enhancer cluster. And also it's the expression level of alpha synuclear is correlated to the, to the enhancer activity. You can see that the neuron is much higher, uh, but in the cerebellum and cortex, it's, it's, uh, the expression level is extremely higher compared to the other cells. And most interesting thing is that the GWAS data analysis of uh, the SNPs associated to PD risks are located, mainly located in this enhancer cluster region. Uh, so you can see here this, uh, uh, most of this dot, the, the yellow dot are located in this enhancer region. So, so this uh, PD risk associated SNPs may uh, change the enhanced activity or change the enhanced promoter context through which to to affect the expression of alpha nuclear and finally cause the PD. Uh, we also used our uh, animal models to prove the function of the enhancer. So we, we have generated the synuclear transgenic model. In this model, uh, this, the rats carry the whole human genes, like over 150 uh, kilobits pair of the gene. Uh, and then we use CRISPR-Cas system to knock out this, the whole intronic region, including the enhancer one and the enhancer two. And then we test the human synuclear protein and uh, rat synuclear protein. So you can see here in this enhancer knockout model, we uh, almost did not detect any uh, protein of human synuclear. That means this intronic regions predominantly regulate the expression of alpha synuclear. So we also detected the uh, human synuclear mass in the RNA level. So we want to sh show whether is there any any aberrant splicing or any axon skip uh, transcript. So we, we did uh, QPCR, and then we didn't find any extra band, but, and also found only, only very, very weak expression of alpha synuclear in this enhancer knockout model compared to this transgenic model. Um, so this data showed that this intronic enhancer region predominantly regulated the expression of alpha synuclear. So we suppose that this enhancer region could be used as a treatment target for Parkinson's disease. So we can modify the activity of this enhancer and then used, uh, used it as the tra new treatment method for, for Parkinson's disease. And in our experiment, we also, uh, we generate step one knockout rights model and we found that Homozax knockout sap one need to embryonic lethality. So here, this is the sap one. Um, um, here, this is the sap one uh, homozax knockout embryo that they, they have a problem to develop into the, uh, the into the animals. And in the mouse model, science, another report also showed that homozax knockout or knock in both uh, need to have embryonic Lethality. So in order to know how SAP1 mutation need to embryonic lethality, we use the mouse embryonic stem cells as a model system, and we knocked out SAP1 in uh, the SAP1 gene in mouse embryonic stem cells, and Western blood showed there's no expression of, uh, of SAP1, and we also did chief of SAP1 in wild-type embryonic stem cells and SAP1 knockout embryonic stem cells. And we compared the, 
A type one motif with another transcription factor is the YY1 motif. So we found they have almost the same um, binding motifs. And also, binding site analysis for found a larger amount of step one uh, binding region overlapped with YY1 binding region. And then we we did YY1 chip seek in wild type and step one knockout embryonic stem cells, and we found in uh, step one embryonic stem cells, the binding activity of IL-1 uh, decreased significantly. So that means uh, step one and IL-1 have very similar binding motif and also have many common binding sites, so which may indicate step one, one facilitated the genomical binding of IL-1 in this mouse embryonic stem cells. And another report found that the viral one is a structure regulator of enhanced promoter loops because the chip has a sequence showed that the viral one oh, many mediated the uh, enhancer enhancer contact or enhancer promoter contact or promoter promoter contact but the CDCF chip had showed CDCF many mediated the contact between uh, insulators and here also showed that uh, the CDCF many mediates the big loops formation, but uh, the viral one many mediates the enhancer promoter contact. So, in order to show whether step one can also mediate the enhancer promoter contact, we established in, um, two methods the high C and capture high C. So, for high C, we, we first cross link the cells and then use the restriction enzyme to digest the chromatin, and then we use biotin to fill in this stick end, end uh, to fill in the stick end and then ligate it, and then we get big fragments. Afterwards, we can do sonication, size selection, and also uh, strip uh, strip tavadin, pull down, and to get the interesting fragment. Afterwards, we can ad add an adapter and to do sequence. If we're doing sequence here, we if we are doing sequence here, we got the high C data, but we can also do hybridization, use the bait, uh, con uh, use the bait to capture the promoter region so we can um, also afterwards to, to pull down again and then to, to do sequence again. So here we got the capture, the promoter capture high data because we, we sequence only the interest region associated to the promoter region. Uh, so here this is the high data, what we did use the em mouse embolic stem cells and, uh, and, and then we did the intra-test analysis, inter-test, intra-sub-test, and the inter-sub-test analysis. And then we found only, actually only one region has changed their, their test. So actually they have changed their insulate score here. But uh, we found only one region in, in this whole genome. Afterwards we did capture high C. So uh, this is the raw rate of capture high C. You can see the, there's the peak here, so that means this this region can contact with the promoter of this of these genes, and you can see here the sub one chip six showed they can bind to this region and also this this region. So that means sub one may mediate the contact of these two promoter. Um, <coughs> next, we uh, we differentiate the mouse embryonic stem cells into the. Uh, embryonic body and uh, neuroprogenitive cells, and then we did analytic. We found some stem cell associated gene were not activated in cell one mutant cells. For example, this AFP1, AFP gene, the less less tin gene, and also TRIST1 or FOXK1. Af afterwards, we, we used this <coughs> rat embryo. So this is a normal embryo, and this is a cell one knockout embryo. And, and the single cell analytic. <coughs> then we found the similar changes. For example, this Fox K genes is highly expressed in step one wild type gene uh, embryo, but it's, it's expressed in very low level or in, in a small amount of group of cells in step one heterodox uh, in step one knockout embryos. And the same changes were also found in less in less gene and also just <clears throat> actually in this here we use, we establish a new method called capture high C. And actually the capture high C can be used for for other different uh, human diseases. For example, this 
this uh, this capture hash rate. Uh, if you use this promoter as as the target region, you can detect uh, some regions far away from this gene, even hundreds or millions uh, kilobits pairs far away from this gene. And also here, this is the um, capture hash data uh, of this promoter. They have many regions can can contact this gene, so it has been used to analyze the. <coughs> The um, disease associated let's say, in different diseases, for example, the cardiac disease, breast cancer, or choleric, choleric cancer, and autoimmune risk cancer, uh, sorry, autoimmune uh, disease. And this example, this, here you can see that there are some SNPs located in here, but uh, actually this region has a, a strong contact with uh, a lot of genes surrounding here. And also here, the breast cancer, breast, breast cancer uh, risk loci can contact with a lot of genes outside of this, uh, uh, these regions. But you can also find that this contact is different between different cells. So that means uh, we ha when we perform this experiment, we have to choose the right cell line or right tissues. And this is raw, raw rates, you can see the difference could, between could different you, cells. Could you wrap up, please? You're over time already. Oh, okay, this is the last slide, so. <laughs> okay, so from here you can see that transcription factor can directly regulate the expression of gene. We can use a chip seq or RNA seq to find the data, find the data. Or it can also regulate the expression of genes through other transcription <laughs> factor. Here we use the epigenetic approach. And also you can find the enhancer can regulate the expression of gene. You, if you can, uh, we, we use the force seq combined with chip seq. And also human disease associated mutation or variation can also affect the expression of gene, but we need to use like capture high or high uh, approach to find the, the genes associated to these variations. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. If I know. Oh, thank you very much Sorry. for this to the force through the epigenomics and, um, and these uh, very profound new findings to these two diseases. I give one fast question, if there is one in the audience. <clears throat> I think you impressed them with all the different Probably, technologies yeah. that you have Thank applied. You. Um, it's really um, great. Thank you that you came. And if there's more questions, I think you're also at the coffee break. Give me a hand again. Thank you very much. <laughs> so before we go into the last talk of the session, so this was basically a snapshot of what happens at these genome centers and also at the uh, interactions with the calls from the DFG. And at the last talk in the first session, we have now our traditional um, presentation by our industry partners and sponsors. And this time we start with Illumina, with Samuel Kroll. And he has a very broad title. I think we saw already some future right now with FUBO, uh, future potential of genomics. Thank you. Okay, let's... Mein Laptop. Ja. Ähm, ja, ich freue mich auf seine PDF. Ja, mit, ähm, Zum Glück. Ja, nee, nee, wir haben ein Problem, PDFs zu öffnen. Hast, hast, haben Sie auch ein. Ah, ah besser, ist okay. Ja. 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 
Ich mir auch, wenn ich hier hier hängt und dann so. <laughs> it's the future. Um, yeah, thank you very much for giving us also the opportunity to talk today. The title is very broad, um, Future Potential of Genomics. So last week we had some big announcements which I just wanted to share with you in a bit more detail. So the first part of the discussion or presentation will be about our recent advancements in genomics, more or less the news you heard last week. And then we will go into detail about our Illumina complete long read technology and also talk about a bit of data handling. This is kind of one of the crucial bottlenecks when it comes to this huge amount of data we will be soon and already now will be dealing with. So for the recent advancements, uh, let me just give you a kind of snapshot where we've been from the journey from 2001 where we had a kind of whole genome price of 100 million US dollars. Just uh, 2020, we announced with our new Nova C chemistry that this price is dropped to 600 US dollars. And as of Thursday, we managed to bring it down to 200 US dollars for a human genome, um, which is quite significant. So there's even an additional drop by um, three times lower than we had uh, just beforehand. And how is that possible? So we announced kind of our new Nova Seek X which leverages a completely new SBS chemistry, um, uses ultra high density flow cells, um, advanced base calling algorithms, um, custom high speed uh, camera sensors, which improve the, the speed of the readout. Um, we also managed to have ambient chipping and lyophilized uh, reagents. And we have um, the acceleration power of fully automated instrument analysis. So there's kind of computational power built into the instrument and also um, improved optics. How that looks when we think about kind of throughput of um, flow cells, um, we will have by um, Q1 next year, so kind of in the first quarter of next year, we will have available the NovaSeq X Plus series, um, which runs a dual flow cell mode uh, and can produce up to um, 16 terabases of data output, which is massive compared to what we had beforehand. Uh, alongside with that, uh, we have a single flow cell processing instrument, which will be launching in the second half of next year. So the Nova Seek X, both instruments will be able to um, use the full range of our flow cells. So the 1.5 um, billion reads flow cell, the 10 billion reads and the 25 billion reads flow cell running with different cycle configurations. And how that compares um, in terms of pricing per gigabases is that the biggest flow cell, and one has to mention here, if you think about this um, 200 US dollar genome, that's solely for large applications. So one has to take that into account that you need a very high throughput to have that kind of price per genome to be achieved. But here, nevertheless, we have an output of um, yeah, 8,000 gigabases, which is then equivalent as a list price per gigabase to $2 per gigabase. And with the other ones, which is here more or less compa uh, comparable to our current portfolio with the Nova 6, 6,000 S4 flow cell, so our, our biggest current on the market flow cell. We also have a price decrease here then from 
um, almost $5 per gigabase to $3.2 um, per gigabase, but also for the lower um, output range, we managed to decrease the um, cost um, almost uh, halved it. The um, direct comparison of our latest instruments, so the Nova 6000 and the new X series, um, Broadly speaking, it has two and a half times the throughput and is two times faster than the previous instruments, which make really large scale studies possible, but also really drives the adoption of whole genome sequencing, whole exome sequencing in large scale, also in clinical uses, use cases. So the read number definitely way higher, um, but the NovaSeq still plays within that range, so it highly depends. You can't exchange these systems with one each other. It highly depends on what kind of application you want to run and what kind of throughput you really require. But yeah, the number of genomes per hour, that's kind of a nice figure from one genome per hour to two and a half genomes per hour. And also the number of genomes per run was previously with two flow cells on our previous or our Nova 6000 system, um, 48 genomes, and we now increased it to uh, 128 genomes. So in theory, with the new system, you can run up to 20,000 genomes per year, um, which is a massive amount um, to be digested. Of course, when we talk about the $200 genome, that is solely the sequencing cost itself. And there are a few additional costs, so just in terms of transparency, I want to highlight that to achieve the full whole genome cost, you also have to um, additionally put into account the library prep, kind of the indices you need there, the purification beads, um, and then you end up at kind of a price point of 285 US dollars. But what is kind of significant that the price gap between the whole exome sequencing and the whole genome sequencing becomes smaller and smaller. So that it becomes more attractive over time to do just whole genome sequencing because you get more data out of it uh, as whole exome sequencing especially due to the probes you need to cover all those exomes. They require a lot of um, uh, yeah, financial input in terms of the library prep, um, and this gap is getting smaller and smaller so that we see kind of the broad adoption of whole genome sequencing to be the um, application of choice for most um, applications. How is that possible? So here, um, the highest level of accuracy and performance um, is due to our new chemistry. In total, uh, that is not kind of one measure, but there are over 40 patterns which went into our new chemistry. Um, our main kind of advantage is our new uh, polymerase, which we are using, which has a very high fast uh, incorporation and high fidelity, but also our new X-Block, X-Link, and X-Dice. So the chemistry that is incorporated during sequencing is more resilient to heat, 50 times more stable in the solution, and 500 times more stable due to the lipolization, um, and has also a very fast block cleavage, which then results in a fast cycling time, um, fa uh, greater accuracy, and more sustainability, because we manage, due to the kind of heat stability of those enzymes, to now ship all the reagents at room temperature, so ambient shipment is possible, and that results also in a vast amount uh, or vast decrease of the waste production. So on the right-hand side, you see kind of a standard Nova 6 6000 um, delivery once it arrives at the customer side, including all the dry ice. And now that we don't need that anymore, that is decreased to such a small box, still having way how higher output when we compare kind of the data output that is granted by the flow cells. Um, in total, having kind of 90% less weight to be shipped, 50% uh, um, less plastic mass, also recyclable plastics are now being used, and only one box to be unpacked by the customer, which is, makes the logistics way easier. And the, yeah, of course, ambient shipments are no dry ice, and no ice packs are needed, which are usually then just thrown away. Also, just as a kind of nice color feature, so for the people who are working in the lab and they are usually trying to sort the flow cells, as up to now there was kind of a mess and you really had to look what kind of reagents uh, you had in your hands and now we just improved that with a color coding to make it really more stringent and easy um, for your lab automation system. Also, what we can now do is uh, kind of greater oper operational flexibility with more lanes and less library to load in that. 
So now with our Nova 6 6000, we have four individual lanes that we can address. It means like you can load four different types of libraries to one flow cell. And we've now increased that to grant greater flexibility, also taking into account the higher output of the system that you have up to eight lanes that you can address individually. So you can load different types of libraries um, to your lanes. And in total, we have 16 lanes. So two lanes um, are always addressed at the same time, uh, which just gives you a kind of maximum batching efficiency and capacity of multiplexing. And also the amount of library, especially as you're dealing with precious samples, is decreased fourfold. So you need way less library to load, which also when you want to resequence certain type of samples is very useful. And custom primer design, if you are using library prep solutions coming out of your lab or a bit more custom than you can also use them. Um, also a good announcement for the, the people who are having a NextSeq 1000-2000 system already installed in your lab. Um, we will release kind of the new uh, XLEAP SPS Chemistry 3 um, in the beginning of 2024 with kind of a new available P4 flow cell with a data output of 500 gigabases. So we also um, yeah, investing in the mid-size market here and um, can make use of the current install base. Let's quickly go into the Illumina complete long reads because we heard that in a few talks already that short tandem repeats and uh, structural rearrangements are at the moment very expensive. I guess I heard 10,000 for <laughs> kind of deep whole genome sequencing in that regard. Uh, and here we are also um, having a solution which is, will be available beginning of next year um, where we have the capacity on both of our systems, so the Nova 6 6000 and the new X series to run up to um, 3,000 uh, highly accurate genomes per year, so more or less 25 times the traditional long read platforms. And we will have kind of an N50, so the average read length that we guarantee for this application is between six and seven um, kilobases, but we generate reads up to 30 KB as a maximum. And very crucial is kind of the input requirements. We only need 50 nanograms um, to be utilized for the long read technology. <clears throat> the workflow will include two different library prep and a dedicated analysis. Workflow is a single day workflow and as I said, compatible with Nova 6 6000 and, and the X series. This is just to be mentioned because the data output is so massive of those long read sequencers. Um, in theory, we can also run it on an X seq but the, this is now calculated for a whole human genome and just the data amounts can only be handled by the Nova 6 systems. <clears throat> So just to give you kind of a sneak peek, because we often get the question, how does the chemistry uh, exactly work? I can only tell you that much, that um, for the human whole genome assay, which we will launch in Q1 um, next year, that we have two type of library preparations. So the PCR free library preparation and the Illumina complete long read whole genome um, library preparation, which will be then both sequenced uh, on the system of choice, and we have a dedicated analysis pipeline that is, as of now, as for the launch, is only available on a cloud-based Regen analysis, just giving the sheer capacity and the amount of data you um, have to output that it can only be run as of now on cloud. Um, as an add-on, we will also release uh, in the second half of next year dedicated for human a targeted enrichment approach. And that can really utilize more or less the same technology as for the whole um, genome assay. But there you can really decide what kind of areas in the genome you want to cover with long reads because you might not essentially need kind of to cover your entire whole genome but just want to booster or enrich certain areas, for example, HLA, which are usually hard to cover with short read technology and thereby have a more cost effective and um, um, more com tailored to your needs comprehensive solution. And that will also be, as of launch, only available on cloud, but of course there's also the roadmap um, for local analysis on our Dragon service. So just in a nutshell how the entire workflow looks again, so you don't need any kind of specialized extraction equipment, no shearing required, no size selection up front, single day workflow, 50 nanograms of input, um, standard NGS lab equipment can be needed, um, highly scalable and also very automation friendly workflow, 
compatible with the Nova Seek systems and with our cloud-based analysis platform. Here are some kind of data on difficult to cover um, genes, SCRC, here you can see um, Illumina short reads that they really struggle in certain type of areas. Uh, and here just as kind of a comparison how Illumina complete long reads perform here. You see a kind of very nice aligned variant calling to kind of on market long read technology that is kind of nicely uniform. And also for um, complex structural variants, which in this case stretch um, 700 base pairs. Uh, and again, Illumina standard short reads struggle in identifying this um, um, variants which result here. But our Illumina um, complete long reads really kind of is comparable variant calling to the on market long read technology. And also, just as a last example for this one, I can really resolve large. Um, Indels, as one example, with 2,500 base pairs for the on-market uh, on long-read technology and the Illumina Complete Long Read also manages to have kind of a similar uh, large Indel calling in this area where, yeah, as I said, Illumina standard short reads would usually struggle. Also in terms of um, precision, and then we brought that out together with our Dragon, there's an FDA truth challenge to really determine what kind of um, genomes um, have the highest accuracy and highest coverage of all the regions. And we already kind of went even with our new Dragon analysis platform, including our graph genome and machine learning algorithms compared to, um, yeah, that's packed bio long reads. But with the um, Illumina complete long reads, we even exceeded that up to 99.87 um, um, F1 score, which is a kind of confidence interval to really measure the genome accuracy. And when you look, you might think that um, because beforehand or as of now, we have 99.83, that's kind of a, a small um, increase, but you have to uh, envision it across the entire genome. So those 0.04% um, that you see here might look small, but that will result in a few thousand variants that you miss with the standard technology compared to the other ones, just in a relation to the sheer size of the whole genome. Quickly going also into kind of um, the complete long read switch enrichment, just to see how it more or less works, that you really only um, want to see or want to boost the regions that are of your interest. Um, uh, you can see with the Illumina short reads, some regions are not covered, which you can, of course, see with the Illumina complete long reads as a whole solution. But if you're only solely interested in those regions, you can just boost them with a certain type of probe design to make sure you cover them um, correctly. And here's just kind of another similar example showing that you can nicely boost your um, areas of interest with the enrichment. So just to sum up for, for that part, um, the Illumina Complete Long Reads really provide kind of uh, an accessible, a highly accurate, a continuous data from existing Illumina platforms, so from the NovaSeq platforms, which are comparable to on-market long read technologies. Also, um, the long reads um, as a total will be launching in Q1 next year, so only for human as of now, and um, that will, yeah, give kind of higher accuracy in calling variants and challenging and difficult to map regions with high uh, homogeneity and repetitive regions, but also structural variants can be resolved. Um, facing of variants and calling haplotypes, I didn't show that, but we also have data here and can be nicely addressed. And we will have the enrichment pipeline launching the second half of next year um, to make sure you really target only the known uh, or relevant for you um, challenging regions. Just as the last thing, what I want to mention is data handling, um, because this is just massive amounts of data. If you envision kind of one single NovaSeq run can um, do 128 genomes in one run. So you have to handle the data somehow and build the infrastructure around it and cope with it. And um, that is just to highlight um, kind of the given idea about the sheer amount of uh, data that is being produced. So we have at the moment surpassed the 20,000 sequencers being installed globally. Um, and the growth only in the biotech data between this 10 year period is 50 fold. 
um, the generated data, and that is 2019, so outdated, um, by all the Illumina sequencers alone is 150 petabytes of data, <laughs> which is a massive amount, and the kind of classic storage of a um, human whole genome, 30x coverage, is at the moment 50 to 70 gigabases if it's uncompressed, and you surely have to um, cope with that. But for that, um, as I mentioned a bit earlier, for the new Nova Seeks, we incorporated four Dragon servers into the system, which really make sure um, that you can utilize kind of uh, the most accurate secondary analysis with our graph genome and the machine learning, which is implemented in our Dragon pipelines. It also is kind of the most comprehensive one, as we saw. Um, across a broad kind of applications, uh, genomes, exome, transcriptomes, you name it, um, and it's ultra efficient. So it's a very fast data transfer, easy to manage the data, because you have kind of, due to the compression, a reduction of storage costs of up to 80%, as we can use our Aura technology to really decrease the amount of data you are getting out. And you can streamline the data directly into our Illumina connected analytics to really make sure you have large scale data management uh, for huge cohorts and biobanks, uh, but also for larger scale projects like we heard beforehand with the 500 exome um, that really has to be managed in a feasible way. Um, and uh, there's full flexibility, so it can be run manually, locally, cloud, or in a hybrid format. Um, and, and just kind of what is also a nice feature that once you start the sequencer, the dragons will start working and start analyzing the data in a simultaneous fashion. Um, and that really decreases the amount of time you have to wait until everything is done. Um, and you will get your face, first base calls um, while um, the sequencing is processing. And yeah. I also something, uh, so as you have the four dragons in, installed in the um, NovaSeq, you can also simultaneously address different applications, up to 32 applications can be addressed in those two flow cells as you have the individual loading of the lanes and even a per sample analysis can be selected on each of the flow cells, which makes it really nice to handle the data in a kind of very customized way and not in a one streamlined um, analysis pipeline. And that's kind of as a last slide, just giving you an overview what our data handling um, can look like if you want to make full use of it. So we have a Clarity Limb software, which customizes the lab management um, solutions for high throughput labs, then the instrument software itself with run planning, seeing when the run is starting, when it will finish, um, the Dragon onboard and the in-cloud version, um, which is currently at launch, will support those four pipelines, the so germline enrichment, uh, RNA, BCL convert, but also aura compression is included. And for the entire data management, also of multiomics data, we have our Illumina connected analytics um, to connect all that data and make use, um, combine them, manage, aggregate them, and um, um, have them in a kind of manageable fashion. And that's where I would like to close. Um, also thanking you, I guess um, the advancements we made in kind of technology is only really feasible with all the great users who are using our technology. And I guess we made it through that 500 genome together. You were using our technology and I think it's just the beginning of the genome. So we just entered the genome era and I'm happy to continue it with all your um, support and all your great research projects. Thank you very much. Yeah, Sandra, thank you very much. Are there questions? One. <laughs> Hi, hello. Um, as a great user of your machine, uh, I was wondering, you show that, of course, environmentally friendly, less packaging and so on. Uh, what it comes in terms of energy consumption and heating and so on, because I think this is kind of very important, especially here right now. Um, do you have any data on this? Yeah. So more or less, just to start with, the footprint of the instrument is more or less the same as the Nova 66000. It will produce a bit more heat than the previous system, but a tiny amount. I can show you later if you like kind of the direct um, parameters. But what one has to take into account if we think of environmental costs is also that the heat uh, produced per genome more or less 
as the instrument produces way more data on the genomes is then still reduced compared to the Nova 6000. But then, yeah, there's a slight heat increase, but it's, um, yeah, very minor. Okay. I have one last question. Sorry. The cloud definition, is that also cloud on-premise, data lake on-premise, on or is this a cloud that Illumina is, or with partners having somewhere out there? Yeah, so in terms of cloud, we are at the moment uh, mainly supporting Amazon Web Services, but also next year we will start integrating Azure. Also for large-scale projects, um, we are definitely always open to talk. If you have kind of a local cloud solution that you want to promote in a larger scale, I, I know we are in discussion on a certain type of project, and then we can definitely look into it. And the only consideration um, is to take that the Dragon is an um, FPGA card, so it's not a normal CPU, but needs kind of a, it's a different acceleration type. And then the cloud service, which would use its services, would have to um, integrate that in their cloud infrastructure. Sure. I think there's uh, everybody looking forward for coffee. Oh, one last question. No. You <laughs> can ask him then oh, in the coffee. Yeah, so we are going into variant interpretation as well. We have already our um, Illumina Connected Insights germline, which is for yeah, rare disease cases that we also do variant interpretation and will also go further for the somatic variant interpretation to make sure we really cover the broad spectrum of software. And uh, one last question. I imagine you, you already uh, make full use of your existing Can you take, can you take the mic because the people on the, on the yes, online would not hear you. <laughs> um, I imagine you make full use of your existing um, data set to be able to filter out all the um, uh, what, artifacts, sequencing artifacts and all that. Um, okay. Yeah. And you can provide, can you also provide the allele frequency information based on all your sequencing data or? Yeah, I mean, most of the databases we are using are publicly available. For example, for the graph genome, we are heavily making use of the 1000 Genome Project to make really sure we're using kind of the haplotype data that is out there. Of course, we also have data collaborations with larger um, biobank initiatives, which we are leveraging, but most of it is publicly available and we can share it. Also, the documentation on the Dragon, all the databases it's using, it's all kind of uploaded in GitHub and has a good documentation. Excellent. Summer, thank you very much again. Yeah. <laughs> and coffee break until four. Uh,